me and the Von Erics. There's eight of them in the ring. I have the claw on all seven of them. Wow. Watch TNA and the shittier it got. To the back! As usual, our favorite show of the week, TNA. TNA. All I know about this is, uh, I was going over my notes right before the show started. I failed to write down the winner of the main event, and I have no idea who it was. <laughs> I don't know what happened in the finish of the main event of the show. Think. I know what the, what the match was. It had eight dudes. I'm guessing somebody ran in. <laughs> or, or there was a weapon involved. Uh, Think. Cage was there. Angle was there. AJ was there. He's likely to have done a job. Kaz was there. I'm guessing AJ got pinned. Let's do this like hypnosis. Okay. Think back in time to yesterday. You lost four hours ago. You lost your fucking phone. You showed up 15 minutes late. You walked in. We watched ECW. We watched it all the way through. Kane and his bloody forearm rubbing all over, or Big Daddy V's bloody forearm rubbed all over Kane. Then it was time to watch TNA, and we watched the show. And what happened in the main event? There were eight guys there. They need to regress forward in the match. Christian and Angle... Regress forward as far as you remember. I remember that Christian and Angle were on the same team, but they... they, 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 You can't really regress forward, can you? Christian and Angle were on the same team, but they don't like each other, and so they were sniping at each other and whatnot. Uh, What do you remember about the match? AJ Styles was funny. Relive it in your head. That's all I remember, dude. I I, I remember AJ Styles was funny in the beginning. He was being the, the... he was being the wacky heel who was afraid, but acting like he's not afraid. And then at one point, he fell over the ropes into the ring. I remember they went to the commercial. When they came back, they showed that Angle and Christian had fought during the break. And that's all I remember. Give me a clue. We're going to recap this show. And then at the end, I predict you're going to remember. <laughs> Hopefully, or your recap will suck. They announced that finally... We were going to get the showdown between the Angle Alliance and the Christian Coalition, who I believe this started two weeks ago. Why waste time? Barash interviewed Christian and Robert Roode, who I presume are together, but I'm not entirely sure because they were already arguing. Roode basically told him Booker T was trying to take a spot, so Roode said he would take care of the problem. This took him like four minutes. That's right. Roode said it was a revolving door of has-beens in TNA. Awesome. Awesome (laughs) writing on this show. Then we had Booker and Charmel coming out, and he said he was going to explain why he left WWE. The reason he left, he said, well, you have to wait for my book to come out. Yeah. But he was going to tell us why he was in TNA, so at least for half the battle. Competition, he said, and to bring the company to a new level. Make TNA the best promotion in the world. Said he wanted to uh, go out the same way he came in 17 years ago, shocking and amazing the crowd. Talked about his 32-inch waist. He better not have a 32-inch waist. Best promo he cut in a long, long time. Robert Roode finally came out and, and said for the last four years he'd been busting his ass. And every time he turned around, a new washed-up has-been from the other side of the tracks was there trying to push him aside. That would be the wealthy, affluent side of the tracks. Said Booker wasn't going to push him down the ladder, challenge him to a match later on tonight. Free on impact, no build, days before the pay-per-view. Why not? Christian or Crystal interviewed the Charisma Express. Oh, sorry, I thought there was. I thought you were. I, two things. When Booker said he was going to say why he left WWE, the, the crowd chanted, "They are racist," which, in this particular instance involving the career termination of Booker T, is probably not true, but it was still funny. Two, yes, this is a feud between one guy who's the, apparently a washed-up has been, and another guy who came out, and Booker T did not know who he was. Yeah. TNA, everybody. TNA. Prism Express, Jimmy Rave, Lance Hoyt, and Christie cut a promo. I have no idea why Jimmy Rave is with them. I mean, in storyline, please explain this to me. 
Why would this man ever be with this bitch and this other geek? <laughs> Don't understand. Why would the bitch be with the geek? It's, it's just un- well, that's easy to understand. It happens like that all the time. But why Jimmy Rave would be involved with these two, I have no idea. So they actually showed a replay of the chick from the Latino Nation hitting Christy. That was eye-opening. That was they showed a replay. Christy mentioned that she had been laid out by the Latino Nation, and I watched the show. This is the show I reviewed when Brian was away in the death tour, and I had also completely forgotten about this. I had, it had totally slipped my mind, and I had no idea what she was talking about. And then they showed a replay, and I said, oh, yeah, she got beat up by a Latino. Okay. So there you go, TNA, a replay. Well done. Fine work. Jimmy Raven, Christy versus Gail, Kim and Eric Young. Gail versus Christy was incredibly bad, like almost ECW girls match level. And then Gail applied this absurd arm bar. I, I don't even. She invented it. I, I can't even explain what it was. And then Christy kicked her in the vagina, basically, and she sold it. And then Raven Young were like Angle and Michaels compared to the girls. Hoyt ran in, which of course in TNA was not a DQ. Uh, the girls just ran right. Through the middle of the ring. Yeah, rest just looking right at him. 6'9 dude stumbling around there. That's fine. Gail hit Ray with a diving Hurricane Rana, and then Gail pinned Christy with a cradle, and of course we had to have an angle afterwards. Uh, that involved James Storm and Jackie coming out with beer. Everybody left except uh, Eric Young. They had a, a speed beer drinking contest, 60 seconds, and um, they claimed it was the second annual, even though the first one was last month. I don't know what an. I, perhaps that was supposed to be funny. Maybe. I don't know. I didn't laugh. Eric spilled most of the beer, but still won. And that wasn't bad enough. Um, actually, first first Storm broke a beer bottle over Eric's head. Didn't get the memo. Then he uh, hit him with a, a unprotected chair shot to the head, for good measure. I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I just don't understand TNA. I, I just don't think about it. it. I, I can't even get mad. I, I, I'm just, I, I'm uncaring. Like, there, how can you be so? I ask a question every week, so I'm not even going to bother asking. Well, we know that we know we get their 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 wrestling ideas in 1997. Perhaps they're also watching news broadcasts in 1997. They're not aware of what's going on in the outside world. It's amazing to me. <laughs> but they, they they had the match. It was it was there. It had the big finish. The Gale hitting the Rana. So that was cool. And I thought, okay, that's fine. And then James Storm came out. And I thought, oh Jesus, fuck! I have to pay attention more. And, Watching this show, it goes beyond being a chore. It's like a burden. It's like a punishment that you can't escape. It's just, it's a struggle. I, I feel like I've done something wrong, and, and TNA has been sent to punish me. That's <laughs> very likely true. <laughs> Apparently. And uh, I should note that when he got cut open, uh, Eric was bleeding in an utterly grotesque manner. Like a mofo. As is kind of like, you, you don't see this almost ever. I mean, uh, you've seen guys, I think Undertaker and the Brock Lesnar match was one of them, but Eric Young had blood. It, it was literally like you turn on a faucet, and it was just leaking out of his head. It was so disgusting, and it was hard way. Yeah. And I just sit here, and I think, is it worth it to get hit hard way by a glass of beer bottle and get a piece of glass embedded in your head, cutting you so deep that you leak like a faucet, and an unprotected chair shot to the brain, which has been shown to cause serious brain injuries, if you, if you get enough of them. All for a segment on Impact, which we never even saw a replay the rest of the night and probably never will again. It, it was a self-contained little segment that ended, and that was the end of it for the entire evening. Is it worth it? To me, the answer would be no. The answer is fuck no. Apparently, the answer to some people is yes. So, uh, God bless you. I guess, but yes, this is, he was bleeding so bad. I, you mentioned the faucet thing, which is fortunately rarely seen, but there was a point... Where he was on his he was on his back and the the cut was pointing up, and you can still see blood flowing out of his forehead. That's no good. It was gross. And AJ and Tomko cutting a promo. He said the two of them were going to be like an L, a well-oiled machine with Christian tonight. And well, last time I saw Christian, he was chasing AJ, so I didn't know what was going on. Sanjay and Jay Lethal versus Team 3D. Johnny Devine came out before the match with the X title on the show. I missed. Apparently he was determined to be a traitor in the X Division, and the Dudley stole the X title. Brawled out in the crowd forever, apparently a no-DQ match. <laughs> I have no idea anymore. Somewhere in there they did say it was a street fight. Oh, that's right, it was a street fight. That's right, they were correct. Lethal did a huge dive off a balcony. Sanjay did an awesome springboard dive over the barricade. Place was going nuts. Uh, then they hit a... Uh, Sanjay hit a 450, and Lethal hit a flying elbow on Bubba. Devon broke it up. Not even a transition. 
This was not even a transition. It was just a spot in the middle of the match, a 450 and a flying elbow, yeah. and he just kicked out. Yeah. So then later on, <laughs> it gets better. Yeah, later on, um, we had Sanjay hitting a flipping van terminator on Devon with a trash can, and both men jumped on top of Devon to pin, and he still kicked out, sending both small men flying. And then they hit a 3D on Sanjay, and, and uh, when they jumped up to hit this 3D, they both jumped up like they hadn't even been touched all match. Oh. So it was just totally nonchalant. It doesn't and matter this small. Uh, uh, the whole thing went four minutes, I might add. Baffling. <laughs> actually, <laughs> not really. When I, when I actually think about it, yes. not at all. Uh, Any other promotion, I would have been blown away. Not TNA. Oh, this is par for the course of the TNA. Yes, I... Uh, I'm not done. Oh, okay. But I went to uh, whip both guys afterwards, and the Motor City Machine Guns made the save, which, uh, of course, led immediately to the back. To the back. But, yes, this is, this went, as, you, as you say, it went four minutes, and the babyfaces were on offense for 3.55, and then Johnny Devine did a distraction or hit a guy with a cane, and Team 3D hit the 3D, and that's it. That was their sole offense for the entire match, and then they got the win. This, this was absurd. And we had AJ and Tom go backstage with Angle. A lot of yelling and screaming. Literally no idea what went on here. And the bad thing is, I don't care. <laughs> you don't know and you don't care. All I know about this was, at, at back of the ground, this was a poster for Turning Point, which I think is the pay-per-view they have coming up, but it's a pay-per-view they have. Out on the poster are Black Rain and Judas Macias. Yeah. No buys. <laughs> no buys. Rhino and the Boogeyman. It was actually uh, Johnny the Bull in disguise as Relic, which they made sure to point out is killer spelled backwards. Very clever. Uh, we had the match. Um, I don't know what happened. There's a point here where Rhino apparently got stiff so what bad. What happened? Did you forget to write down this one? No, I just don't remember. No, I do remember that it, Johnny, Johnny, Johnny the Relic had beaten. He was beating up Rhino and beating him and beating him. And one point he hit him, and Rhino grabbed his head and rolled, rolled out of the ring. And I thought, Jesus, what did he do? Did he kill him? And, and then Rhino apparently realized, I am not dead, and he rolled back in and laid down. <laughs> like, went to pin him. So, apparently, Rhino got drilled at one point in this. Yeah. And uh, they, working. they kept working, they kept working, and then Rhino hit the spine buster, and then he hit the gore, and then he pinned him. Relic, your, your TNA career is now 0 and 2. Oh, that's right, yeah. Relic. And you lost to Rhino, the guy who never wins. Right, Relic. The Rey Mysterio of Impact. Relic did get pinned. I'd forgotten about that. What a shocker. So uh, Black Rain ran in afterwards to attack Rhino, and Abyss made the save. And I swear to God, this is what happened. As a joke, I wrote, I sure hope he comes out with his tax. And sure as shit, he came out with his tax. Spilled them all over the ring. Everybody went running away. But, uh, yeah, tax. Woo! AJ and Tomko would talk to Christian, who yelled at them. Christian said he came to the conclusion he didn't need either of them. As of today, the Christian coalition was no more. AJ nearly cried. Uh... Apparently they agreed that AJ would go talk to Angle or Karen or somebody. I, I don't know. Again, I don't care. I know that Christian's delivery was great. That's the only thing I remember about this. And then we had the big meeting. Yes, the, the big meeting is right around from AJ, more. Karen, Borash, Christian, Tomko in a conference room. AJ said they had to work together to make life better for mankind as a whole, as well as TNA. Asked Christian and Karen to shake hands. After much hesitation, they did so. AJ jumped up and down and surfed on the desk and acted like an idiot. Told Tomko he knew it would work. They left. And then Christian, as they were leaving, grabbed Karen, very violently, I might add, and basically told her if she or Kurt screwed him, it would be the worst thing they ever did. And, again, Christian's delivery, awesome. The rest of this, impossible to care about. All I know is that in this in this room were Karen, AJ, Christian and Tomko, and they were all talking about Kurt Angle, so he's involved. That's all the top heels on the show. And every single one of them has played up as a comedy character. <laughs> you're supposed to laugh at Kurt Angle. We're supposed to laugh at Christian. We're supposed to laugh at AJ Styles. You're supposed to laugh, I guess, with Tomko, because he just rolls his eyes at it all. And we're supposed to laugh at Karen. And, yes, even Borash. He's not really a heel. But all the big villains on the show are comedy. Everyone's a mid-carter. <laughs> Everyone's a mid-carter, Yes. So we've been talking about for two weeks now. Everybody in TNA is a mid-carter, which is why every pay-per-view receives no buys. Robert Roode and Booker T. Booker was great, had his working shoes on. Robert Roode is awesome. Robert Roode's biggest fan was there in the crowd, looking quite hot. And Booker, I guess, got the win with the axe kick clean. And, and if, you, course, if you count Roode getting a chair, but he didn't, he brought a chair in, but he didn't get to use it. So I guess that's clean. Sure. 
Christian hit the ring afterwards to help Brood attack Booker. Then they went after Charmel, who was trapped in the ring. Kaz made the save. Tracy smiled. Uh, apparently, this built up some matches to the pay per view, but I don't know which ones. And again, I don't care. <laughs> you would think, based on this, it was Christian Brood versus Booker and Kaz. I don't know that. You just would think that's the case. I also, it occurred to me here that after Kaz won that goddamn fight for the right bullshit, and he had the big match with Angle, and it was a very good match, he's put over as the next rising star. Then there's the Thanksgiving show on which he does not appear, and then he does not appear on this show until right then, and then he was one of eight dudes in the main event. Just lost. Everybody's a mid-carder. <laughs> then we had Crystal interviewing Scott Steiner in the greatest segment I've ever seen. This was TNA, so he had no idea what was going on. He all but asked, Crystal, what the fuck is going on around here? So she then tried to explain the feast or fired match at the pay-per-view, which is where there will be four briefcases, and three of them will be uh, either a tag title, world title, or an ex-title shot, and then the fourth one is a pink slip. Scott Steiner, after not knowing what was going on, not understanding the match, after the match was explained to them, he blew off the firing stip, saying, who could possibly fire me? What bullshit? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'm going to win the world title. Walked off. This, if ever there was a single segment that personified TNA, this was it. I saw her go with the, the, the Rikishi promo where he did not know the name of his opponent. This was better. <laughs> this was actually better because he didn't, he didn't know anything that was going on. He had to have it explained to him. And after it was explained to him, he didn't care. He didn't care, and he knew it was stupid. Yes. He just played along with it. So that leads us to our main event of the evening. AJ, I, I can tell you who was in it. A, no. Christian Cage, Kurt Angle, AJ Styles, and Tomko versus Kaz, Scott Steiner, Samoa Joe, and Abyss. And I have already told you everything that I have written down. AJ Styles was funny at the beginning, but funny in in a, in a you know, he looked like a dork. Uh, they went to the break. When they came back, they said Christian and Angle had been fighting, and then the rest of the match happened, and I am literally of no help to you at this point. We had AJ being a geek at the beginning. We had Heat on Abyss, which was funny, the monster. Uh, the best part of this match to me was actually when uh, it broke down. There was a moment early on where five or six guys were in the ring. It was not the hot tag. It was during the Heat. All of a sudden, just six guys were in the ring. And Tomko looks up, and he has this look on his face like, what the fuck am I doing here? And I thought, you know, Tomko has improved to the point where he is too good for TNA. TNA is below Tomko. You should just fucking stay in Japan and have your tag matches and just be happy. Why the fuck do you come here? I don't even understand. So Abyss did a face-first backdrop on AJ. Don said he went close to 20 feet in the air. Broke down to an eight-way. They went to a commercial. When they returned, there was heat on Kaz. And then? I'm going to, Kaz probably hot-tagged somebody. I'm going to press Samoa Joe. I was say Samoa Joe pinned AJ Styles a muscle buster. And then the show ended. Oh, that's why I don't remember. Jackass. The show started seven minutes late because somebody at Spike fucked up somewhere along the way. And so it ended seven minutes late, and so we missed the last seven minutes of the show. Okay. And again, who cares? See, that's the key. <laughs> that's, the, that's why I didn't even write down show ended. I was just, I didn't care that it was over. I didn't care who won. I didn't, I was not care, I didn't care that I didn't get to find out. So I actually feel less stupid now. Oh, you're still stupid. Oh, well, that's fair, fair enough. Think of how many times I got angry that a UFC show went over the time limit. And we had these huge debates about, how it's a sporting event and all this other bullshit. And, and I pointed out that a fight is going to go X number of minutes. And so as long as you start the main event prior to a certain period of time, you will never go past the top of the hour. I made mention, you know, plenty of people don't set their VCRs. They don't think about it. We had debates that went on and on and on and on and on. You know how angry I would be if Raw went so far over the top of the hour that I missed the last seven minutes? And here it is, TNA, and I didn't give a shit. I could have fucking cared. I, I could not have cared less. It would be impossible for me to care less. That's right. And there, and there's a replay on Saturday, and I don't care enough to find out what happened. <laughs> no. I didn't get the results. I don't care. <laughs> this is the go-home show for the pay-per-view in two days. Yes. Such a completely inept group of people writing the show. It is completely... It's just... 
Everybody go to FightNetwork.com, read my new column. I actually have friendly advice for the folks at TNA that would help them with their shitty program. They won't listen, mind you, but uh, this actually would help. This is real, honest-to-God advice, and it's not, please quit. It's actual advice. That's my advice. Please quit. Everybody head over there right now and check it out. It's actually on the front page of our website as well, a link to the column. So that's that. And that's it for today's show, everybody. We're going to be back on Sunday night. The TNA pay-per-view, as noted, is Sunday. So we'll be back to recap that show, which my guess would be a fine wrestling show. Although, to be honest with you, aside from the feast or famine... Of which I don't know any of the participants. Scott, we know Scott Steiner. I don't even know a single match. I don't even know the main event on the show. <laughs> the main event of this show, which we just watched a two-hour program, which you would think they would hype it up. I do know this. It will be Tomko, AJ Styles, and Kurt Angle versus Samoa Joe, Kevin Nash, and Scott Hall. Okay, so unless Kevin Nash and Scott Hall came out at the end of this match, which I would presume they would have had to have done, they weren't even on this show. No! This... I, I'm saying this right now, and I guarantee this will not go in my Brian is Wrong folder. This will be the least purchased pay-per-view the entire year. There are no title matches. Nothing not that anyone cares about those anyway, but it's all personal Vendetta stuff, and it's Vendetta's we don't care about. Yes. This is an utter no-buys failure. I would anyone buy this show. It, this is, it baffles me, but uh, that's true, so... The TNA pay-per-view, which was a great show and then fell off the cliff like you almost never see a show fall off the cliff. Obviously, the big question for the evening is, where the hell was Scott Hall? The lesser question of the evening, where the hell was Rhino? I didn't even realize Rhino was gone until Vince kept making a big deal about why Rhino wasn't in the match, like this was important. But uh, the answer, I actually don't have an answer for everybody. I have somewhat of an answer. I can tell you that neither man is dead. Oh, good. I can tell you that neither man just didn't show up. Like, okay. like they were expecting Scott Hall to be there, and they have no idea where he is right now. That's not the case. Both guys had alerted the company in advance that they were not going to be there. There are many stories about why they weren't going to be there. I know there were a number of different stories about Hall. He had, he had claimed some sort of, of health issue, and I believe Rhino had claimed some sort of health issue as well. But it, it, neither of them were, were matters of grave concern. Neither man had a heart attack. Neither man is missing. Neither man is dead. But both men did actually not show up at the pay-per-view. They were not backstage this particular evening. So they did shuffle around the, the card somewhat. Raven replaced Rhino. And the Scott Hall thing, I don't know. I guess we can just jump. Let's just jump we right, to, the, right to, to Samoa Joe. Let's just jump right to the main event so I can get all the hatred out of the way first, and then we can talk about stuff that was actually good. The match, of course, was supposed to be Hall, Nash, and Joe against Angle, Tomko, and AJ Styles. So Hall wasn't at the building. And they played that into the storyline. There's no Hall. And at the beginning of the match, or before the match, actually, Joe was screaming at Nash backstage, and Nash is like, I'm more worried about Hall's health than, than this match. And Joe's like, I don't give a shit about his health. So, anyway, they, they came out. Angle, Tomko, and AJ came out first, and then Nash came out. No Joe. No Hall. Nash was all alone. Finally, Joe came out, and he grabbed a mic. And he cut a shoot promo. That's right. A classic. Somebody noted that this was exactly like Bash of the Beach. Yep. Where Samoa Joe was playing the role of, I believe, Vince Russo. And uh, who was playing? I don't remember who was playing what roles. But anyway, the point is, uh, it was the 1998 Bash of the Beach promo where Joe came out and he said, um, Hall's not here. He didn't care enough. Uh, there are two kinds of wrestlers in TNA, the diehards that bust their ass every week, the superstars that uh, think they can do whatever they want, uh, the superstars come out and screw over the hardworking wrestlers and the fans who pay to see them no matter how old they are, at which point a woman screamed, shut up, stop being a crybaby, and I have no idea how nobody laughed when this occurred, I because did. I heartily laughed. I this. chortled. So he's in TNA with the Motor City Machine Guns and Jay Lethal and himself, young athletes looking to change the world. 
Men on scaffolds risking their lives, while other men showed up and padded their pensions. And he looked at Kevin Nash, who was standing there in the background looking as bored as a human being could possibly look. He told Scott Hall to kiss his ass. He said, you punked out and you're a punk? And he looked down and, and made the, the comment, well, fire me if you want to. And, of course, the question is, why didn't anybody cut his mic? Well, who knows? So he said he asked all the X Division guys who wanted to be his partner. They all stood up and said, me! But one in particular begged for it. And so he introduced his partner, who was Eric Young. He's not joking, everybody. No, it was Eric Young. Eric Young came down the ramp to participate in this here main event. Sure did. So uh, then they had a match. And Nash, who had been buried throughout this promo for being old, stayed and wrestled. And you know what? Joe was right. Nash is old. He looks 80. No, no, not a year younger than 80. Nash had a complete and utter lack of heat. Uh, they did some moves. They did some hot tags. Nobody gave a fuck about the hot tags. Nobody gave a fuck about anything here. And in the end, Joe pinned Tomko with the muscle buster. And that was the end. They 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 went away, and uh, that was the end of the the pay per view. Nash disappeared. It was a a mega thumbs down in every conceivable way. And I I've been alerted by many people that I was going to hate this, that I was going to passionately hate this, just the whole the whole kit and caboodle here. Sure. But the reality is, I didn't, and I'll tell you why. Because when Joe was speaking and cutting the stupid promo. All I could really think in my head is, this is no stupider than every other stupid thing they do. <laughs> is it? <laughs> is this promo any stupider than the match with the briefcases? I would actually hmm. argue that the match with the briefcases was even stupid. You actually may have a point with that one. <laughs> I just looked at this and I was like, wow, Vince Russo wrote a shoot promo for this guy. Nobody gave a shit. How could I be mad? How could I care? See, I don't think the promo was even the stupidest thing about this match. I, I think he, he spent the entire promo talking about great young guys like Saban and Shelley and, and Jay Lethal, and there's also guys like Senji and Chris Daniels back there, and he picks the guy who's afraid of his own pyro. But you know what the problem was? The big problem with this is there, there are people actually raving about this promo. I'm not one of them. And the reason I'm not one of them is because what was the point? I don't know. I mean, here, here's the whole uh, unless deal. Unless they're going back to 2000 and doing the new blood again. Here's the whole deal. I'm sure that Joe probably believed a lot of what he said, and I'm sure that, that a lot of people, you know, watched it and thought it was it was great that he was getting a chance to say all this and everything like that, but uh, I just listened to the crowd, and no one in the crowd cared. No, except for when they thought he was being a crybaby. Yeah. She it, cared. And to me, the whole, the whole problem with this is everybody in that crowd has just given up. On the X Division and the young guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, when he said Nash was old, he got booed, folks. Everybody's just like, he came off as just a guy bitching. There's, it's not like, it's not like it was a couple of years ago where there really was a feeling that all these young guys were being held down and people cared about it. That's the key. I mean, obviously, young guys are being held down today in TNA, and you've got old guys on top, but it's now to the point of apathy. Nobody yes. really cares. Back and when, it, it's the same thing with it's the same thing with the the Bash at the Beach promo in '98. Nobody gave a fuck then either. That's the whole deal. That is if, if people cared, if people really cared nowadays, then then Joe's promo would mean something, and that's why it meant something to, to the people that still do care, that still do feel like these young guys are being held down, and if only they would get a chance. Whereas jaded people like myself realize, ain't gonna happen. I've given up a long time ago. I long since gave up on the young guys getting a shot in TNA, at least a shot that means anything. And and thus, this promo was just like a stupid shoot promo that no one cared about. So I wasn't mad. I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't angry about anything. I just thought, dumb promo, boring main event, nobody cared, end of the show on a, on a sad note. <laughs> and, and, That's and it. Doesn't lead into anything, and nothing, nothing was settled in this match. There's nothing no. on the line. There's the no, nothing was advanced. It was just, it was just a pointless match, which is not a good way to end a pay-per-view show. No, no this this promo might have, promo might have worked. Uh, Plus, let me say one more okay. thing. Here. Like I like I feel sorry for TNA for Scott Hall deciding he wasn't going to work tonight. Yes. Oh no. How how can this be? Boy, you guys sure got screwed by Scott Hall. <laughs> Wrong. 
Scott Hall screwed you, and, and uh, you should have seen it coming. Yes, you were stupid enough to fall in his trap. I, I'm surprised Nash didn't also screw you. I mean, really, you got off lucky tonight. <laughs> Only <laughs> Hall, though, showed up. One of them showed up, yes. Yeah, Nash actually showed up. You guys should have been fucking happy. That's a shoot promo you could have, you should have cut. Holy shit, Nash is here. <laughs> I can't believe Hall didn't show up, but thank God you're here, Nash. That's what the promo should have been. That's a shoot promo tonight. Yes, if, if, if Joe had come out and talked about the young guys being held down like a year or two ago when Jarrett was champion and people were trying to drop the title at him, sure, that would have worked. That would have worked. No one gives a shit about the belt now. Nobody gives no a, one cares. Nobody gives a shit. It's, it's funny what they did give a shit about here. Just They gave a shit about stuff that was different. And and I think I think one of the uh, I mean the, the thing that blew me away most on this show was Gail Kim and Awesome Kong. Fuck yeah! And and people cared because number one, it's it's relatively new. It's very new, in fact. And number two, they have not been given a reason to not care about these people yet. Whereas God bless Samoa Joe. I think Joe's a great wrestler. I think he had a lot of passion in his promo. But all of the fans right now have been it's been hammered in their heads. That Joe's just a guy. Indeed. And, and really, the, the special thing about these girls is they aren't just guys. No. They're girls. Well, that's <laughs> new. Seriously. That's a new thing in TNA. Girls having good matches. So, yeah, that uh, that worked better than anything else on this entire show. And until the point comes where the girls are nothing special, I'm sure uh, that may be the only thing that anyone gives a shit about. So, let's run down this match, or this show. Like I said, it was... I really like this pay-per-view up until, uh, I would say all the way up until the Abyss Relic Raven Black Rain match. Then it sort of started to go downhill. and There was a lot of really good stuff on the show, a lot of really horrible stuff, and sometimes it was the best and worst of TNA at the same time. Literally at the same moment. When was that? When, uh, in the opener, when the okay. machine guns... Yes. Okay. <laughs> all right, let's get going now. Team 3D and Havoc versus the Motor City Machine Guns and Jay Lethal. It was a tables match. We had uh, everybody doing a bunch of stuff. It was basically a, a, a hardcore match with tables and, and high spots. That was the uh, that was what made this different from the thousand thumbtack match, for example. There was a bunch of great high spots and that sort of thing. So anyway, they had this this match, and, and the defining moment of this match, as Vinny was about to mention, was that in the end, I'm just going to cut right to the chase. In the end, the director missed five dives. One dude putting himself through a table and a ref bump. How is this possible? Why, let me explain. There was a spot early on where all three of the baby faces were going to do a simultaneous dive to the outside. Now, I'm going to ask all of you listening to this right now, if you were the director and you knew that three men were about to do simultaneous dives from three different sides of the ring onto three dudes outside, what is the camera angle that you would choose? I would suggest a wide shot. You know, that's what I'd suggest, too. Well, this guy suggested otherwise, or he determined to do otherwise. He, at first, did a close-up of Alex Shelley doing a dive, but slow on the trigger. Mm. So he missed it. All of a sudden, you, you see everybody about to do a dive, and then the camera cuts away, and you just see Alex Shelley lying in a heap on the outside with another dude. So at this point, the director panics, I guess, and decides to uh, get a shot of the second dive. So, of course, what does he get? Just the aftermath. And so he immediately tries to get a third dive, and what does he get? Just the aftermath. He missed all three dives. Yes. And, and the best thing was it, 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 came off, it, looked, it came off looking like they came in a sequence. Like Shelly dive, Saban dive, and the lethal dive. And they were all missed. Missed dive, missed dive, missed dive. Indeed. This was so grossly incompetent. It was so bad, it was hilarious. It was. It, it, we went, there was that time months ago where I got just furious at all the missed shots. This time, I skipped right past Fury and went straight into blind Murph. I was just giggling. Then later, we had Saban and Shelley both going for a dive at the same time. And once again, did he decide on a long shot? No. He decided to try and get Shelley's dive, but again, too slow on the trigger. Saw him just on the ground in a heap. And then he immediately tried to get Saban, and he was on the ground in a heap as well. Two more dives! Missed! Indeed. Then we had uh, uh, Havoc, whatever his real name is, attempting to put himself through, or somebody through a table. He missed it, went through himself. What did we just see? A man in rubble. A man laying at a table. Missed it! And then, of course, the referee took a bump, and I don't know where the director was. I believe it was the camera was closing up on somebody being choked on the ropes or something, and you just heard a bonk, and the ref was down. Indeed. So, this... 
this was like they had to have done this on purpose. <laughs> this, does this go into the theory of uh, the whole world being a rib on you? No, this is just like let me explain this. I, I was reading about coin flips, where if you if you flip a coin, there's a 50 percent chance of getting heads or tails. Okay. If you flip it twice, there's a one in four chance of of getting the same thing two in a row. Sure. And it just you know it goes on and on and on and something like in order to get ten in a row. It's one in this It's very, number. very hard to do. And then to get 100 heads in a row, it's impossible. The number is so high that it would, in fact, never happen. Right. So, in order to miss five out of five dives, a man going through a table and a ref bump, I, I cannot possibly believe that this could be an accident. It's actually mathematically impossible this to happen by accident. It, feel, it feels okay. to me that it is mathematically impossible for this to be an accident. You make a logical and rational presentation. I must ask, do you have a theory as to why they would do such a thing? Because he's really stupid. <laughs> I don't have a good because answer. He, he thought that would be best for the show. <laughs> he must have. Or he was like, oh. maybe maybe it's like the the, the 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 theory of film direction that you don't show the violent act, you show the aftermath and the reactions, and people leave it to their imagination. Perhaps he listened. That to does the, not work for sports broadcasting. Perhaps he listened to the the Saturday Brian and Vinny show, and he didn't like the impact review, and he decided he was going to put one over on me. He was going to fuck us. Yeah, and then everyone else had to suffer, which happens all the time in wrestling. Don't get me wrong. Not not, not related to me, but when when people get mad at people. They punish them, and thus everyone in the entire rest of the wrestling world has to witness it. Right. Okay, so that's the only thing that could have possibly happen here. So, anyway. So we're sorry, everybody. This this video, the filming of this match sucks because of myself and Young Brian. Clearly. Yes. It's the only, it's the only explanation. So, anyway, the ref was down. Lethal put Havoc through a table, but then Team 3 beat everybody up and put Havoc on top of Lethal in the rubble. So the ref woke up and signaled for the bell. If you miss any of that, who fucking cares? Who doesn't matter? Who fucking cares? This was the opener. This was really stupid booking. This was grossly incompetent uh, technical side. All the wrestlers, you guys did fine. Thumbs up. Yeah. Sorry, sorry you got screwed. I gave this three and a quarter stars, which, uh, and I give the ref, or I give the director five stars. You deserve this night, Dave. <laughs> he could not have done his job any better. <laughs> his job of presenting shitty television was perfect. Could not have been done any better. It was it was shitty production of the year candidate. Five stars. <laughs> I I think it's a shitty shitty production Hall of Fame candidate. Probably actually. Nash cut a promo saying the only reason he hooked up with Kurt in the first place was to get in Karen's pants, which is fascinating since <laughs> he turned her down, if I recall correctly. And Joe grabbed the mic and got pissed and said all Nash could talk about was getting in Chick's pants. And he said he was going to his locker room, and when they were ready to be serious, they could come find him. Wow. Didn't happen. Roxy Laveau and ODB versus Velvet Sky and Angelina Love. It was during this match that I finally figured out that the latter team's gimmick is that they are amateur porn stars. I, it's true. They, they have porn star names, as we noted several times. One of them wrestles in what appears to be lingerie. They, they come out, and they, they, they take turns doing the Stacey Cuba rope entrance. They uh, shake their ass. They shake their ass a lot. They, they have both stolen Candace Michelle's Go Daddy dance. This match... Can, and most notably, they wrestle like two amateur porn stars. And they do, in fact, wrestle like people who are amateur, yes. <laughs> amateur and everything, really. Uh, this match, we saw spankings. We saw wedgies. We saw people attacked in the vagina. We saw vaginas used as weaponry. Yes. <laughs> And ODB does the worst selling I think I've ever seen in my life. Beyond that, I don't know what else to say. This was bad. This was a bad wrestling match. One of the porn stars pinned Roxy, star and a half. That's very generous. And there you go. Okay. I realized that I wrote in the uh, in the update that I could speak for hours on this match, but really that covered it. No. <laughs> it's there's more jokes in the newsletter. I don't know what I, don't I really they, don't know what else to say. I don't know if they translate into uh into uh, verbally telling these jokes. The, 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 there was an extended sequence where that was built around ODB getting a wedgie and not being able to remove it and needing help. If you want me to talk more about that, you're on the wrong show. This was horrible. This was it, terrible. So yeah, the In show fact, was off to a five star. We are about forty minutes into this by now, by the way. I'm actually changing that to a half star. <laughs> You've just done the star or a star and a half. Review. What the fuck was I thinking? I don't know. Perhaps you the, six, the, the porn stars aren't in fact really hot. That they, they they swayed your opinion. I will give them that. I will give them that. God damn it. What's happening? Hold on. 
I'm sure we just had copious amounts of, of skipping, but what the hell can you do? Every now and then my computer just decides to start updating shit, and it cannot be turned off apparently, so anyway. <sighs> I hate computers. They do suck. At least it doesn't crash on a bi-weekly basis like Dave's. Mm. Angle met with Christian. They yelled and they screamed. I do not care. <laughs> All I know. Every one of these segments, I finish by writing, I don't care. <laughs> and I, I don't blame you, but it began with Jeremy Boras telling Kurt Angle how to behave. Yeah. Yes. Kurt Angle. I'm shocked you remembered any of this. this I, I, I was shocked at the this rampant stupidity of, it all, stupidity of it all. And it all goes back to how all the top heels in the show are comedy. So, yes, Kurt Angle needs Jeremy Borash to tell him how to, act, how to act cool. And then says, if I wanted to fight, I would have bought AG and Tomko. Yes, Kurt Angle needs help against Christian Cage. Sure, okay. All I know is that anybody who enjoys his show, no offense if you do, has got to have some sort of deep-rooted psychological issues. Because this show consists of nothing but people that don't like each other and can't get along. But, yeah, it's people who don't like each other, and it's their friends. That's the key. Uh, it's their friends or their wife or their tag team partner. It's the people who they're supposed to be on the same side with, and they can't stop fighting. Yes. Shit. And it makes horrible, horrible television. Eric Young and James Storm. I love this match. I love these men. I can only give it three and a quarter. It wasn't, like, the best match I ever saw, but it was the most fun match I've seen in quite some time. It was a lot of fun. At least until here. a little bit later on. <laughs> so, Harris is... is uh, Storm. I'm not... Well, shut the fuck up. Harris is uh, his former partner, and when they broke up, I said many times, James Storm is the one that's going to get over here. I see. James Storm is the better worker. James Storm has far more charisma, and he's far more entertaining. These were all true. Yes. And the arguments at the time were, but but Brian, Chris Harris is taller, still true, and Chris Harris is a better physique. No longer true. <laughs> no longer true. No longer true. No longer true. And James Storm is by far the more entertaining guy. James Storm is fucking awesome. And Eric Young is fucking awesome. And they had a, a real fun match and had the best finish I ever saw. Eric Young's selling of the arm, by the way, was just great. Just great. He made a one-arm comeback that was awesome. And the finish saw Jackie jump up on the apron with beer in her mouth. And she was going to spit it on Eric Young. However, Eric Young moved and she spit the beer all over James Storm. Now, earlier in the evening, James Storm had been trying to get a beer from Jackie, and she refused, telling him he had, could have no beer until after the match. And so when she spit beer into his face, he was overjoyed. And he grabbed the <laughs> beer bottle, and he began drinking. And then he went to hit Eric Young with the bottle, but the referee confiscated it, and then uh, Eric Young had a sunset flip for the pin. Goddamn. Yes. This was two thumbs up. The, the only way this could have been better, and I guess I couldn't do it with what this going on in the main event, Storm should have drank in the beer and been powered up like Popeye on spinach and just kicked Eric and pinned him. <laughs> just drink the beer, woohoo, kick pin. That would have been, been done either way. That could have, that would have worked too. But th this was this was great. This was fun. It was it consisted of a lot of Storm working over Eric Young's arm, including the part where he put him in a Fujiwara arm bar and then manipulated his fingers so Eric, poor Eric was forced to give the, the finger to the crowd. <laughs> it's fun. The announcers in the camera totally missed, but don't worry, James. I saw it and it ruled. And, uh, there was a lot of heat for this, too. People really wanted to see Eric Young beat James Storm. There was no dueling chance. There was no laughter. There was no let's go Storm. And I thought, wow, with with all the heels being comedy guys, James Storm's the top heel in the company. Although he is a comedy guy. Yeah, but not, <laughs> different, though. You, you, he's got a spinning belt with a beer bottle on it. Yeah, but you don't. You, he's not a dork. Kurt Angle is a dork. Christian is a dork. AJ Styles is a dork. James Storm is just wacky. <laughs> Let's just move on. Fine. Regardless, this was fun. Feast or fired? Go for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Brian is has to leave now. So, okay, this was the deal. There was the six-sided ring hanging above four poles in four of the corners were briefcases. They were big. <laughs> Allegedly in these, in these briefcases were contracts. It's a sheet of paper. These were the biggest fucking briefcases I've ever seen. They were more like suitcases. They were big. They were large. They were heavy. They were metal. They were held up by these big, thick chains. And they were hanging from the four corners of the, of, of, of four of the six corners of the ring. So the participants, for those of you who care, 
Senshi, Ida Skipper, Chris Daniels, Sanjay Dutt, Shark Boy, Lance Hoyt, Jimmy Ray, P.D. Williams, Chris Harris, B.G. James, Kips James, Homicide Hernandez, and Scott Steiner. Okay. So it's a battle royal. Now, the key to a battle royal is they almost always suck until the end when it gets down to, like, three or four guys, and then they can actually do stuff, and it's kind of fun. There are no eliminations in this battle royal. There are always tons of guys everywhere, brawling in the ring, brawling out of the ring, brawling at the ringside, brawling by the announce desk, and it was just, there was just always getting in each other's way, and no one could do anything, and when they tried, it usually sucked. So this got a giant thumbs down. Now, that brings us to problem two of the match. You recall that there were four briefcases. One briefcase had a contract for a world championship match. One briefcase had a contract for a tag team championship match. One briefcase had a contract for the X Division championship match. And the fourth briefcase had the Your Fire Pink Slip. And, of course, these were all distributed randomly. So they announced that the briefcases would not be opened until Thursday. So if you bought this show, not that anyone did this, but if anyone bought this show to see who was going to get fired, they didn't see it. You guys got screwed. So sorry. So they're fighting for these briefcases. And uh, I forget who got the first one. I can check here. Pete. Pete Williams got a case, yes. The shortest guy in TNA had to climb on the top rope and reach up and stretch and stretch and stretch, and he just barely managed to get a briefcase down. So he had a briefcase that recently, one. by the way, got on the Triple H bodybuilding he, he, program. He is back on the protein shakes. Yes, he's looking cut. <laughs> I'll say that. So he he got he the, the, the short little guy climbed on the top rope and reached and reached and reached and just barely managed to get this, the the giant massive briefcase down. So he got this and he was happy and he retreated. He was gone. So that's that. Briefcase number two. B. G. James got dumped out of the ring and sold his knee, and I thought. Great. Poor BG has hurt himself in this stupid match that sucks and nobody cares about. I got worked. It was a work because what happened was his partner, Kip James, he got one of the briefcases, and here's the key. You, to qualify as getting a briefcase, you had to be on the floor with a briefcase in your hands. You had to be out of the ring with both feet on the floor and the briefcase in your hands. So Kip James gets the briefcase, climbs down into the center of the ring, He's immediately surrounded by everyone, and so he does not get killed. He turns to his partner, BG, in the ramp, who is now standing up fine, waiting for attention, saying, Kip, Kip, and Kip tosses the briefcase out of the ring, and BG catches it. He's got the briefcase, and he thinks, ha, 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 I'm happy, and then suddenly his eyes go wide, and he mouths, oh, shit. So, yes, this was, in fact, a match wherein guys were afraid to win. Let's recap, by the way. Okay. So at some point backstage before this match, Kip James said, I'll bet there's going to be a point where I get the briefcase and I'm surrounded by ten men. So let's have you fake a knee injury, and then when you're out on the ramp and I'm surrounded by these ten men, I'll throw it at you. Right. That is an amazing <laughs> amount of foresight by these two men. <laughs> they're they're grizzled veterans. They are. They've seen it all. And boy, after tonight, have they seen it all. So, yes. Or the other way to look at this is, Kip decided, I don't want to get fired. I don't want to risk getting fired. I'm going to screw my tag team partner. Either way. <laughs> because they still had to plan this work. <laughs> they still had to plan this. He still had to plan the whole thing just to screw BG. So, this came into play later. Chris Harris, who, of course, his gimmick is that he's whining. He has spent the first part of this match out by the announce desk, not doing anything. Not resting me one, not hitting one. Occasionally going over and complaining about something because his new gimmick is that he is a whiner. <laughs> Hell of a gimmick there. That that's no buys right there. No one's going to buy to hear whining. So as the match went on, people started to not get eliminated, but they just started fighting out of the ring a lot. The number of men in the ring got lower and lower and lower, and finally at one point there was just nobody there. And so Harris got into the ring. He climbed up to the top rope. He reached up, he put his hands on a briefcase, and then changed his mind. He decided it was not worth the risk. He declined to win. And he climbed back down, and he left. Stupid! Stupid, stupid, stupid! They have created a match wherein most of the participants are hesitant to gain a victory. Plus, once you gain the victory, no one knows when it is! No one knows if you've won! So, you was... paid thirty dollars to tune in Impact for the results. <laughs> Indeed, yes. So there was more. Homicide went for the Gringo Killer on Jimmy Rave. 
Chrissy Haney broke it up. The mystery Latino came out, laid her out. Nobody cared. There was a bit here with, uh, actually, was it with Hernandez, Kit James, and Scott Steiner. There's actually a lot of fun. There's also Hernandez hitting a cracker jack on Sanjay Dutt out of the ring into a pile of men. That was cool. And and finally, when all was said and done, there there was a, Scott Steiner went to get a briefcase. Kit James almost stole it, and finally Scott grabbed it and got out of the ring. By the end of this, there was enough good action that I can say, well, I've seen worse. But my God, this is stupid. This was stupid shit. For those of you who do care, for those of you who do keep track, the briefcases to repeat went to P.D. Williams, Senshi, Scott Steiner, and B.G. James. Yeah. Which of those four is going to need a world title match? I bet it's Scott Steiner. I bet Scott Steiner gets fired. All right. Who do you think, do you think Senshi is going to need the world title match? Who, who is I'd that? be fine with that. Who are the three again? Senshi. Okay. P.D. Williams. Okay. Road Dog. Oh, Jesus. One of these men is going to fight for an angle for the world title. I would guess that Road Dog fights for the world title, that Senshi gets the tag titles, that Petey Williams gets the Cruiserweight title, and that Scott Snyder gets fired. Those are my predictions, everybody. That's actually that's kind of solid. BG just... James for the world championship. <laughs> Woo! That's going to be awesome. So anyway, this sucked. <laughs> Indeed. Star and a half. It's being generous. Gail Kim and Awesome Kong for the women's title. Awesome. Brought tears to my eyes at the greatness of this match. What it was was the greatest little baby face versus monster heel that you've ever seen. Gail is such a fantastic little baby face, and Awesome Kong is such an awesome monster heel. And the best part was everybody cared about this match to a degree that I cannot fathom. Yeah. Like, they cared. I don't even know how to explain this, because a lot of you that watch TNA probably don't even know what it means for the people to actually care. Because you always hear these stupid, that was awesome chants after a guy fell through a table or something stupid. You see this, this, this passion where everybody knows, you know, the fans know their role. Cheer for this guy, boo this guy, maybe act like a jackass during this segment. But, you know, in general, you're, you're, you're part of the action in the TNA Impact Zone. Not in this match. These fucking people cared. And it was great. They had a great match. And uh, Kong destroyed her. Utterly fucking destroyed this girl. Gail finally made a, a great comeback. And did a big drop kick off the top and a senton off the top. The funniest part of which is she's so small and Kong is so big. And she still made sure to not even touch her when she did this move. Awesome. That's classic. Yes. So, finally, Kong had had enough, and she began choking her with her boot in the corner, shoved down the ref, and I should note that as soon as she shoved the ref, boy, did this get an angry response, because I think everybody knew they were about to get fucked out of a finish. And sure enough, she shoved the ref a second time for the DQ. People were so mad that they were chanting, you suck, at the ref. That's a win right there. That is a win. They were angry at the ref making a call. Yeah. They didn't scream bullshit or fuck Russo. They were pissed off at the referee. Kong gave the referee a sit-out powerbomb. Everybody cheered like crazy. The porn stars ran in. She killed them both. I will say, I've said many times that uh, Velvet Sky is a lovely young lass. I would be fine with her simply moving to amateur porn. It would be much safer on her body. She cannot take bumps. And as a result, she takes the most horrible bumps you've ever seen. She lands badly every single time, and she is going to get hurt. I guarantee that girl is going to get hurt because she can't safely take a bump. That's bad. When you're in this business and you can't even take a bump, find another line of work. So, fans uh, chanted ODB, but apparently uh, TNA is unaware of how over ODB is with the fans because she did not come out. And uh, Kong killed everybody, gave Gail a sit-out powerbomb on a chair, and uh, all the referees finally came out to pull her off, and I loved this. I loved it. It was awesome. The amazing thing is, in that four-minute recap, I think you underrated this. This was so great. This was, I would put it, and I'm being dead serious, it's just a hair below Eddie Guerrero Brock Lesnar as the best Davy and Goliath match ever. Just Kong is such a perfect monster. When I said earlier the Storm was the top heel of the company, I was mistaken. Awesome Kong. Top heel in TNA by miles and miles and miles. 
The fans do not cheer for her. They fear her. <laughs> they are in desperate fear of Awesome Kong, and they want they cheer whoever she's fighting against because they want to see them not just win a match, but survive against this unstoppable, evil, diabolical monster. The match is put together such that Awesome Kong did not go off her feet for, oh, I don't know, 12 minutes or so. Then Gale finally got some offense, hit a bunch of kicks. Kong didn't go down. Hit a springboard kick. Kong didn't go down. Gale finally hit a top rope drop kick. Kong went down. The place went nuts. Gale hit a sent on for two. Don West noted, and this should have made a bigger deal. This was the first time anyone had covered Austin Kong for a two count. And I, I did, I'm sure that's true. <laughs> but that should have been a bigger deal than it was. So they're having this match, and, and you were talking about how much people care. And that's noted, there were no dueling chance. People wanted to see Gale Kim win. They wanted to see Austin Kong lose. And so then there, there, they, when, when Kong gets knocked down, she gets her first two count, and it just serves to make her angry. That's when she went right to the corner, and that's when she started laying the boots in, and the ref couldn't pull her off, and they started teasing the DQ, and the fans started to get a little restless. And then finally, Gale shoved him down. He called for the DQ. Yes, there were very, very loud boos and chants of you suck. There were also a lot of people, like about half the crowd, who were ecstatic with this because it meant, holy shit, Gail Kim won. They considered, you go back and watch, people were jumping up and down with joy because Gail Kim had managed to beat Austin Kong by disqualification, and that was great news. That's unreal right there. That's absolutely unreal. And then Kong killed everybody. She's still a scary monster. They will do a, be- a rematch tomorrow. This was so fucking awesome. This gives you a giant thumbs up. This was the best match on the show. I guess it was the best match of the weekend, but it was it was uh, just great. Yes. <laughs> this was fine action. Everyone, by turning point to watch this match. I cannot go that far. I can. Although it is, it is amazing to me that the, the same company... I thought about this, too. The same company that books such shit could book something so perfect as the awesome Kong reign and the feud with Gail Kim. It is impossible to believe. But, uh... This this was uh, many levels of awesome, and uh, I, I will repeat it again. Pay the their thirty or forty bucks, whatever it is. Pay that money to watch this match. Guys, take my advice. <laughs> just, just trust us on this one. You're gonna see a rematch on on Impact for free. It's oh, probably gonna possible. be pretty goddamn great. I I don't know if I can recommend thirty bucks for this match alone. I I I, I thought it was great just because of the story and because of of the the atmosphere. I don't think that as a match, I think if you had the, the volume turned down on this particular battle, I think you'd have a different impression of, of really how good it was. Uh, it probably was overall. Let me look at what else we have on this show. <laughs> Main event was worse. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree that this was, uh, this was the best match on the show. It was this yes. or James Storm and Eric Young. Yes, this was the best match on the show. And uh, But I did see the TNA pay-per-view yesterday, which had wrestling that was uh, nope. many, many Many levels Man of up. awesome above this one. Man up was better than this. I'll concur with that. But don't take anything away from this match. This was awesome. So, then we had the Abyss, Relic, Raven, Black Rain match. Raven was replacing the no-showing Rhino. And they had a hardcore match. It was... I don't know what it was. It they was did a bunch of stuff. They did a bunch of shit. And they did stuff. And there was a poll. <laughs> there was, in fact, a poll. Did you have to clamp up in this poll to win? No. It was just thumbtacks. There was thumbtacks in a bag on a poll. Think about this. There were two trays of thumbtacks, giant trays, and each tray had 10,000 thumbtacks on it. They also had a poll with a bag of thumbtacks. Why? Don't fucking ask me. Because Vince Russo likes polls. That's the only answer. You will note... There were no blank and a pole matches in the show, and yet two matches had polls. Yes. He had five polls in the show. What is with him and polls? I don't want to think about it. Did he want to be it. a fireman growing <laughs> up? <laughs> That's the cleanest example I can think of. I, I have no explanation I cannot, for this right here. No, there's no explanation for his phallic obsession. So, anyway, the best part of this match is, is Raven tossed Rain off the apron at one point, and Rain bumped through the table with the box of thumbtacks on it, or the tray of thumbtacks, and... Match kept going, and I thought, how do you win then? <laughs> that guy clear. just went into 10,000 thumbtacks, and apparently that's not how you win. So, they just kept wrestling. And finally, Abyss gave Relic a uh, black hole slam into the tacks, pinned him. 
Relic's <laughs> stellar career. <laughs> awesome. He's now 0 and 3 yes. in TNA. Even in tag matches in three ways, he gets pinned. Yeah. <laughs> his, 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 the ring is metal and his shoulders are magnets. There's no other explanation. He just cannot avoid losing. Instead of Relic, he should be, uh, let's see. Rebodge? I was going to say, say that Rebodge. Yeah, and then today, every single time he comes on the air, could tell us that it's jobber spelled backwards, because he has to alert us to Relic every single time. Like, it means something. Like, all of a sudden, this the fact that it's clever, which it's not really that clever. You spell killer backwards. Wow. Like, we're going to care. Wow. It's, Relic oh, is killer spelled backwards. Oh, killer spelled backwards. <laughs> I can't miss this, then. Money. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. They couldn't find time somewhere in the show to Let give... me ask you a question. All right. Seriously. Why do they keep telling us that relic is killer spelled backwards? I really want to know the answer to this question. Because they think it's... They can't think it's clever. They must it's think impossible. It's, they must think it's so important people know this, otherwise they won't get into him. <laughs> they must think it's a crucial aspect of his character. And i got to say, if you really think that way, well, then you should make sure that every fan in existence gets it. But it's not that clever. It's not going to make a difference. It's... It's not going to have any impact, impact whatsoever. So, yeah, you can knock that off, guys. We get it. It's killer spell backwards. Okay. Yay. So, they couldn't find time somewhere in the prior, couldn't find time anywhere in the prior two hours here to let Raven hand her a microphone and say, here, explain what you're doing here instead of Rhino. 30 seconds, go. No, they cannot do this. They had to have eight segments of the fucking angles instead. So, the reason I freaked out because Black Rain got a promo calling out Raven, and I thought this was another classic TNA moment of a guy getting the name of his opponent wrong. Like when Rikishi couldn't remember Bobby Roode's name or, or something like along those lines. I thought Dustin had just forgotten who was in the match and they hadn't bothered to fix it. So turns out Dustin was right. They were wrong. And they were wrong, but not letting Raven say, here's why I'm here. So they had the match. Raven looked poor. <laughs> I was trying to think of a way to describe him. I came with a worm. <laughs> I noticed this. <laughs> Raven did not look like a worm. I was trying to think of an animal that was soft and white and wrinkly. <laughs> And that's what I came up with. I neglected, the, I neglected that worm are also skinny, and that's disqualified Raven from fitting under the worm category. So he's, he's had better days. There was a point here. What else happened in this? <laughs> There's so much bullshit. Abyss at one point was just a bloody mess. Keep in mind, he wears a mask, and there was still blood all over his face. He had his own blood in his hands, and I sat there looking at this scarified man who still has giant barbed wire scars that scars match a sad boo. He's got... Long scars running down the length of his upper arm because he gigged his arms for an angle that nobody cared about. And everything this guy's done to himself. And he made a comeback, and today he said, Abyss is on fire! And I said, you know, I there's a decent chance someday this man will set himself on fire on pay-per-view. I think that could happen. I think he's that sick. <laughs> he's, Why are we talking so much about this match? Because <laughs> there's so much to talk about for once. No! <laughs> It was a bad match. It was, in fact, a horrible match. This match got a star and a half, and I'm being generous. <laughs> and yes, Relic's gimmick of always losing confusing. Always losing continues. Then Angle met with Joe. You can't possibly have more to talk about. I think I'm done. Thank you. For once, shut up. Angle met with Joe, told him in the main event tonight to do the right thing. He wanted him to be on his side or run in or something. I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. Then we had uh, Booker T cutting a promo saying that Robert Roode is going to slip on a banana peel and take his finish tonight. This is that worse. He will take my finish. Booker T and Kaz versus Christian and Robert Roode. I gave it three stars. I expected this to be maybe one of the best matches on the show. But in the end, okay, here, here's what happened. They, they uh, Good guys ran wild. Bad guys got the heat. Good guys made the comeback. Same as in every match. But the comeback was like half of this match. It just kept going and going yes. and going and going. And they had heat when they were getting the heat. And the comeback went on so long, but then by the end, people stopped caring. That's when you know you've done too much shit. Yeah. So they just kept going and going and going and going and going and going and going. We had rude, waffling Christian with a unprotected chair shot to the head. I don't even care anymore. Well, there's more to see. Talk about that later. I can only get so upset about people's stupidity. So, anyway... Uh, Cast tossed Rude, Booker at Christian with the axe kick, got the pin. Tracy, who'd been happy the entire night when Rude was getting beaten up, was suddenly looking unhappy after he'd been beaten. Don't ask me why. Uh, this was, like I said, it was fine, but they did too much stuff at the finish, and uh, I've seen better. Yes, I, I also agree that the longer this went, the worse it got, and that's bad. It, it started off with 
Booker and Kaz doing very basic stuff and just arm drags and arm bars and it was it was everything to set up the heat. And I thought this is good. This is Booker and Christian are there. They, they these guys know how to do fucking good tag team matches. They're gonna leave the suit. Everything's gonna be great. Then the heels got the heat. And I thought okay, everything's going awesome. Booker's gonna get the hot tag and run wild. They do a big finish. This is gonna rule. And then Kaz and Rude just started exchanging roll ups. I thought well, if you were Kaz, why wouldn't you just go tag and. Then Kaz somehow ended up on the apron, and he didn't try to tag his partner. He tried to hit a move. He got cut off, and I thought, well, that's stupid. Why wouldn't you go tag Booker? So after all this, Kaz finally made the tag to Booker, and people really didn't care that much. No, because Kaz was doing fine. Kaz was doing pretty damn fine on his own. Kaz really didn't need a save. So That's the whole point. That is the key, yes. So Booker came in. He ran wild for a bit. It was good, although the crowd didn't care. Kaz came back. He tried to do some high spot with Robert Roode, and it got royally fucked up, so the crowd cared even less. Things just kept going and going and going, and then Booker hit Christian with a sloppy axe kick where Christian was, like, the wrong way, and Booker had to avoid hitting him with the non-kicking leg, and he got the pin, and then it just ended, and it was people like, okay, next. Yeah, I've seen better. And that was your teammate paper, everybody. I don't know how we've talked for 45 minutes about this show, but uh, like I said, up until the thumbtack match, this was like a easy two-thumbs-up show. Um, as a result of the thumbtack match and the women's match and the shitty main event, it ended up a thumbs down I show. You mean the tag match, not the women's match. What? You said you, you said it was a thumbs down because of the women's match. You meant because of the tag match. You know what I'm talking about. I didn't say the women's title match. And because of the, uh... Oh, that one. I thought you meant the... Never mind. You confused me. I was confused. Okay, well, can you stop talking for a second? Fine. As I was saying, because of the shitty women's match... Not the title match, the shitty women's match, the thumbtack match, and the main event. This could have very well been a, a thumbs-down show. But all the good wrestling at the beginning and the Booker T and Kaz versus Christian and Robert Roode match, I will give this a solid thumbs in the middle. My buy recommendation is no buys, uh, regardless of what Vince might say. And, uh, yeah, so fair job, TNA. But, uh, you know, you, you get a lot of A's and a lot of F's on this show. Try again next month. You're going to anyway. You may as well try. To the back! Now, before we get any further in the show today, I have to give a speech. The speech has not been prepared, but I've been thinking about this speech. I've been wrestling with my conscience. I have been... I have actually been discussing this with other people. Not Vinny. Other people that mean more in this business than him about what I should do, and I'm just going to tell the story right now. Last night, we were watching Impact, and I was filled with hatred, as I always am with this show. And during the main event, I finally, I finally could take no more. And I shut it off, or I hit the stop button, and it said, do you want to delete? And I said, yes, I deleted the show. Didn't even watch the entire main event. I I decided that my life is too short to continue watching this show. And you'll recall that many times on this program, Vince has said the exact same thing. Why do we watch this show? And what did I always say? I said, Vince, the show sucks, but it's important that we watch it. There are people that want to hear us talk about the show. I don't know what all my excuses were, but I wouldn't let you stop watching it. And I finally made the decision that in the end, Vince, you were right. This show is fucking useless. It's never going to get any better. I, I'm i 32 years old. Uh, if I live to be 125, as I have planned, I have less than 100 years left on this planet. And I'm sick of wasting two hours of my life every single week, week watching such utter bullshit. So I decided, that's it. Impact finished. I will buy all the pay-per-views, but I am, I'm never watching Impact again. It's just not fucking worth it. So I made this decision, and I, I felt a little bit better, and I wrote this. In fact, let me read what I wrote. I'll read exactly what I wrote in the newsletter, because I wrote a speech as I was losing my mind. Let me find it here. I'm just glad you've come around. That's all I can say. I'm not finished yet, so shut up. Mm. All right, let's see. All right. Angle's crew versus Christian's crew in a 10-man tag. Yes, they're actually doing this match tonight instead of at the pay-per-view. I thought they were kidding. You know what? I quit. I'm ending impact coverage in this newsletter. 
The show is such a waste of my time, and at 32, I just don't have it in me to waste my time like this anymore. Such a fucking useless show. I'm more than willing to buy the pay-per-views every month, because at least I can see some good wrestling, but this show is just the worst programming I've ever seen in my life. I don't care what anyone says. This is so much worse than Nitro or Thunder ever got. At least I can laugh at how stupid that was. This just makes me angry and causes me to hate this business that I've loved since I was 14 years old. If you're reading this and will quit if I don't cover Impact, well, that's not very nice, and I'm fine with someone like you not subscribing. I can't handle this anymore. But listen, I will make everyone a deal. I will compromise. I will give this another shot starting at Final Resolution. I'll watch the pay-per-view and go back to watching Impact after that. But I'm doing a one-month boycott, and I don't give a fuck what anyone says. This is my newsletter. Review over. That was the end of the review. And I had it set in my mind that I was in, I was boycotting this, particularly since it's the holiday season. It's supposed to be the season of love and camaraderie and whatever else the fuck it's all about. And Impact making me angry for two hours every single week was just not going to cut it. So... Then Vince went home, and I went to do the Dave show, which you can all listen to, and I cannot explain it. I don't have a logical explanation for it, but Dave could always find something good about Impact. I have no idea how. For example, what did he enjoy about this? Just listen to the show. All right. So he just went on and on, and I mean, he the show was horrible. He ranted about it for 20 minutes. But unlike me, who would rant about it for 20 minutes and find almost nothing good at all, he could still manage to find good stuff on this show. There were still things about Impact that he, and I quote, enjoyed. Impossible. I asked him that question. I said, H- how? How is this possible? <laughs> I mean, I, I, you did the show immediately after we watched Impact. I said, I have known you for 10 years now, and I'm constantly amazed at the love you have for pro wrestling. And how you can you can you can watch Impact and find something to enjoy about it. So I sat there and I thought, if Dave can do this, I can do this. I mean, seriously, how can this man how can this man find something good about this show? It just it's impossible for me to fathom. So then So then today I had to do a show with Diamond Dallas Page. Positively Page. Positively who who Begins every public appearance with the the the, the, the always ask how you doing and he says never had a bad day in my life. Diamond Dallas Page was on the show today. Now granted, eighty five percent of the show was YRG, but still, eighty five percent of the show regarding YRG he was still very positive. He told about great things that he had done for other people as far as them losing weight on his YRG program. He talked about how he was feeling great, and he was 51 years old and had recently made a return to the ring and realized afterwards he was never doing that again. But he was he was so ungodly positive, and you could hear him smile on the air through the entire hour-long interview. And then when it's over, of course, he doesn't watch Impact either. That's a caveat I should mention. why he's happy. So then that was over, and I went to the gym, and I had a really good workout. I don't know why. I just I just had a really good workout. Actually, you know what it was? I'll tell you what it was. After DDP was off the show, I was I was walking back into this room and his YRG book caught my eye. I have no idea how. I actually had looked for this book several months ago the last time he was on and I couldn't find it. And for some reason I walked into the room and it was like the only book on the shelf. And I was like, well, that's weird. So I started reading through it and everything like that, and it's just like interviewing DDP. It's all happy and positive and great, and you're going to be healthy and fit and this and that. And there was a section about breathing, how to breathe properly. So I read that section, and I I did a couple of the stretches and everything like that. And then I went to the gym, and I went through my whole circuit training workout, the same one that two weeks ago I nearly vomited doing. And I fucking went through this like I was asleep because I was breathing. Mm Mm-hmm. And then I did my cardio, and I was breathing, and and I fucking just blitzed through that. So it was a great workout. And I left, and I was on my way to teriyaki, and I was just in a a really good mood. And I started thinking about impact. (laughs) What a roller coaster you've been on the past 24 hours. So I'm thinking about impact, and I, I was driving down the road, and I was thinking about how Dave can still find something entertaining about this show, and how Dallas Page never lets anything bother him. And I thought... Why am I letting this television show 
make me so angry? Why am I letting a show booked by a bunch of jackasses fill me with such hate? Really, this is a battle between me and Impact, and Impact is winning. (laughs) That is so completely unacceptable. And I actually thought about what you had said last night when I flipped my lid, not exactly defending the show, but you basically said that I don't even care anymore. I've long since given up on this program. You, you, yeah. you care so little that it doesn't bother you. And I've decided that that's what I, I need to do. I am going to continue to watch this show, oh. but I just am not going to care. And in fact, I may even step up my burials of this show. I may even start burying things that are good. There aren't any, though. <laughs> Dave is lying. That's Every it. now and then there's a good match. But I'm going to find some way to bury that even. I am I am going to somehow... <laughs> I can do that about last night's show, by the way. But go ahead. <laughs> I am going to somehow make this goddamn show enjoyable. Okay? I am determined. I will not let this fucking show beat me. Do you understand? <laughs> do you understand? I will not I let that I think I happen. do. Somehow I am going to defeat this show. I don't, I don't care how. See, ideally, ideally, somebody from Spike TV would subscribe one day and go back and listen to the Adrenaline Flush archives, realize what shit this program is, and cancel it. And then I will have accomplished my goal. But barring that, somehow I, Brian Alvarez, am going to fucking beat TNA Impact. I am not going to let that show defeat me. That is what I've determined. So you decided... You would rather sacrifice two hours of every week until the day you die than admit defeat. Yes, actually. This is where you and I are different. Actually, and and I don't even look at it that way. I'm going to try and find some way to enjoy that two hours. I don't care how. I just decided. What, I may start drinking like you have already done. Yes, I, I, I have yet to watch a two-hour impact totally sober. Okay, you may have... You may be a renaissance man. You may be a man ahead of your time. Every once in a while I come up on a good idea, okay? yes. I will drink. Perhaps I will I will um I will recap something that actually wasn't on the show. Perhaps I'll make shit up. But I'm going to do something that is going to make me enjoy this two hours. Even if impact has absolutely nothing to do with that enjoyment. I will mm. make fun of what I can make fun of. I will enjoy the limited stuff that I can make fun of. And I've also decided that as soon as I start to get frustrated, I'm just going to give up on a segment. I'm just going to stop. I will write about something else, or I will not write about anything at all. The next time we have another segment where eight different things happen, and I'm supposed to keep track of all of them and take notes, and one just bleeds right to the other and everybody's yelling and screaming, I'm just going to give up. I will just quit. No. I, will, I will randomly look around on the Internet for something and type about what I found, I will do anything but let this show make me angry. That's what I've decided. Okay. Now we're I, 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 can, I can see your point of view. I, I... How can you let a television show better you? It's not a matter of being better than yes, me. Yes, it is. No. If, if, you're, if you are allowing a show, uh, an inanimate object, it's not even an object. It's a... It is a, it is a series of flashing lights on a box yes. in my fucking living room. If I can allow that to get the better of me, I'm not a good man. I, I look at it the other way. I, I think you're. How can you be a good man and allow two hours of your of your of a day, one day? How can you allow two hours of a day to waste? That's what I'm saying, though. I'm not going to waste that two hours. I will find a way to make that two hours meaningful to, in some way. Does this mean I have permission to bring a book now? I don't know about a book. We'll think of something. Maybe a board game. I. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll bring Clue. Drinking. I'll bring Clue or, or Operation and bring those over. I was thinking beer pong. <laughs> Between you and me? Sure. There would be no drinking involved. Even spin the bottle, actually, I'd be No, okay. <laughs> there I put down. Something. Unless we just get a lot more people here. Something will be done to make me enjoy this two hours. I don't give a fuck what it is, but I will I will, I will, will be a better person than uh, TNA, which is not a person. You need, ping, you need a ping pong table. I'll get something. I swear to God, next week, next week I will have fun during that two hours. All right. And it may involve very little impact, but I don't care. I'm going to have fun. So you're go- what's basically going to happen is you're going to have fun. There will be a television on showing impact, and your laptop will be on the other side of the room. Anything else, you have no idea. 
the laptop will be close by in case there's something that I feel that I need to record. Sure. Sure. But uh, And by, by something you need to record, it could be a thought, a poem, perhaps a song lyric. Yeah. 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 And I guarantee that will be that will be uh, that will be fun for me. And as I've said before, I don't care about anybody else, okay? This is my website. This is my radio show. It's an empire. I appreciate everybody who subscribes. I love you all, but I am not going to let this website destroy my uh, mental capabilities and drive me mad, okay? I do very, I, I very much do plan on being insane at some point in my life, but this is mission far, accomplished. Far down, no, I'm talking. I see a horse whip and I collapse. What? <laughs> let me just move on. I expect that to happen to me someday. I see again, mission accomplished. Ninety years old. Ninety years old. Somewhere around there, I'm I'm fine with starting to lose my mental capacities. It fucking is not happening at 32, and it sure as shit ain't happening because of this fucking show. Wow. God. See, you're getting mad now. No, I'm just getting. I'm you're getting, getting hot. Okay, I'm gonna calm down. No, <laughs> here's hot. what we're gonna do. We're gonna review Impact. I'm going to tell you everything that's gonna change. Okay. All right. And anything that I feel that I can recap here, I will recap. Anything that I can make fun of, I will make fun of, of which there is plenty. <clears throat> we had a turning point recap, at which point I noticed that the Darth Vader guy, all of these promos that he does for these uh, pay-per-views and for Impact, they have become parodies. That's funny. That's funny. When he first showed up, it was like, wow, they raided the guy from WWE that does all the... the uh, the promos. This is a big coup for TNA. And it was it was great for, like, one show. And now today, it's a parody. It's comedy. It is the same shit every time. I laugh. Yes. LAX and Relic versus Black Rain. Wait. LAX versus Relic and Black Rain. Uh, they had a match, and Relic lost again. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> okay. I... Also I funny. take it back. I take it back. All right. When I asked what Dave Meltzer could possibly find entertaining about TNA, I find it entertaining that Relic always, <laughs> always loses. Yes. And I don't mean he loses in his singles matches. When there is a three-way, Relic is pinned. When there is a tag team match, Relic is pinned. And every time it happens, I throw up my hands and I giggle. So, yes, yes TNA, you have managed to entertain me that way. You actually overlooked a very brief segment. Like most segments, it was less than 30 seconds long. But the show opened after the turning point recap. All the guys who won a case in that stupid battle royal thing, they all showed up in the building, and they were all carrying the cases with them. Yes. It's big, giant beef cases with big, heavy chains. And so they all pulled up in their cars, and they got out of their car, and they grabbed their gear bag, and they grabbed their briefcase, and they in, went in. And the last one in was Petey Williams, who, who, who pulled in, and he parked his car, and he opened the door, and he stepped out, and he grabbed his gear bag, and threw it over his shoulder, started to, started to walk away, and stopped and said... He slapped his forehead and gave the oh yeah motion because he had almost forgotten the briefcase which he had fought so hard to attain. Yes. And then he grabbed his case and he went inside. And then they did some, I don't know exactly what happened, but this is the first bit of the show. Triple X was there and they were fighting. That's right. This was the theme of the show. Everybody hates each other. So the really, every show. My hatred of this show just fits right in with the booking. Yes. So I'm fine with this. TNA is all about hatred and, and bile. After uh, the Relic deal, the Rock and Rave Infection ran in and beat up LAX, and the Mystery Latino made the save. This was also funny, because they said, Cornette's not going to be happy with this man-on-woman violence. And meanwhile, the uh, fake Latino, uh, the Latino Nation member, had huge boobs. That is, that is funny. Funny. It's, it's also funny. Because they're stupid. <laughs> it's like the fourth time that's happened, and it's the same thing every time, and it's also funny that... Every match in TNA has to have some kind of wacky aftermath. Did you ever hear, this was my greatest moment, if I do say so myself. Many years ago, on I think it was the Observer Hotline, I did a, I think it was a Thunder Review. It was the circus music. I played carnival music in the background throughout the entire review. I never heard it, but you've told me about it. I need to do that for this impact review. This... We just need to get on a loop. Carnival music, just to play in the background as we recap the show. That would make it fun. You know, it's it's almost, that's not silly enough. We need a live accordion player. <laughs> he needs to be in the room, over in the corner by the bookshelf, just cranking away on the polka. I wonder if uh, Brent could, uh... Does Brent play the accordion? He seems like the kind of guy that would play the accordion. But I don't think he can play any instruments. <laughs> <laughs> For the, uh, flute. Let's move on. 
<laughs> I don't care anymore. That's clear. I do not care about this. So then we had uh, something with cornet, lethal, machine guns, Team 3D, and we're moving on. Because I don't care! <laughs> so there was too much shit going on. All right, then we had uh, Kurt come out, and uh, he said something about Christian, and AJ and Tomko were there, and I think he said they had an hour to, uh, Christian had an hour to come out and join them. <clears throat> I guess that was what happened. There was more? I don't care. I just wrote down, Angle wants Christian and Rude. Good. Borash interviewed Christian immediately, mind you. Angle gave him an hour, so they immediately interviewed him. And he, of course, is teaming with Robert Rude. So, of course, they're fighting. Right. Yeah. They had a fight. Sure. So, uh, Christian said he never won any world titles. Uh, they needed to shut up and listen. They got in a fight, like I said. And uh, and Christian said he would be there in an hour to talk to Kurt. ODB and Gail Kim in a non-title match. Another funny thing. Mike Tanay. Now, this is not Don West or Michael Cole or even Joey Styles. Mike Tanay had to call Gail Kim versus Awesome Kong the best women's match in the history of wrestling. <laughs> Worldwide. Boy, that poor bastard. So, they had a match, and uh, ODB won. Why? I have no <laughs> earthly idea. That's more comedy right there. Yes, Gail Kim got pinned by ODB. Yes. The, the fans love ODB. They chant her name, and so, of course, she cheats to win because she's a heel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's more comedy. What the hell else happened? And then Awesome Kong ran in and beat up Gail Kim, and it was the only thing on the show that was any value. That actually was good. Gail's comeback as, as the fiery but determined baby face was, was awesome. Yes. Then we had a, a deal with Matt Morgan in the briefcases. Uh, Triple X is fighting. Uh, somebody took a briefcase. Doesn't matter. Brush interviewed Tomko about the Angle Christian thing. Uh, Tomko said he was going to do what he wanted to do. Chris Daniels versus Senshi with Elix Skipper as referee. The winner of this got possession of case number three, which was Senshi's. So, Hermie Sadler did commentary. Funny. Race car guy. Knows almost nothing about wrestling. Right. Bad. He, he did point out that uh, Triple X was willing to fight each other for this case, and we had to admire that. <laughs> so, yes, infighting is, in fact, admirable in the universe of total nonstop action. Of course it is. So, uh, something happened, and somebody won. I think Chris Daniels. He got the briefcase, and uh, that was that. Yeah. Chris Daniels won. He pulled Elix in front of him, so Elix was mad, and then he had to count the pin slowly. So I guess Triple X is broken up. I guess then she quit. I don't really know. In the middle of this match, in a space of about eight seconds, they cut to a limo pulling up backstage. Eric Young was driving the limo, and then about 17 people all climbed out. <laughs> yeah. An entire locker room climbed out of this limo and walked away. I actually wrote them all down. Eric Young, Samoa Joe, Kevin Nash, Booker T, and Kaz. And you would think Charmel. Kevin Nash and Samoa Joe are, are friends now. Yes, yeah, so that speech that Joe me at the pay-per-view, forgotten. Yeah. And, by the way, they plugged the, the, uh, the backstage fight in the TNA Mobile, so. Angle alert. We knew that from day one. Uh, then we had uh, VKM talking to oh, Morgan. Oh, this thing. This is so horrible, but it was funny. I've never seen a worse segment <laughs> in my life. <laughs> and uh, somebody took a briefcase again. So... Anyway, the point was Matt Morgan was supposed to keep an eye on the briefcases, but every time somebody walked in, they took one away. So, hell of a job keeping an eye on the briefcases, I guess, was the running joke throughout the show. So, VKM was there, they had a briefcase, and they were, guess what, everyone? Fighting! Fighting! They were fighting over the briefcase, and VG said he could win and get a title shot, but he may not pick he may not pick Kip to be his partner, and Kip was angry. And then the voodoo queen, who, as an actress, is... She's such a great wrestler compared to her acting ability. And <laughs> she said this thing was cursed. Cursed. Be, yes, cursed. There's a curse on this briefcase. Someone cursed the briefcase. So BJ started to fight with her, and then Kip and her were fighting, and then they all left. Horrible. Horrible, horrible television. And uh, then it got worse. We had an even dumber segment. <laughs> Mike Tanay was interviewing Jim Mitchell. I'm just looking at this. This was the second of three segments in a row where each one became the new worst segment I ever saw. Yes. They are interviewing, uh, and, and I, I actually, when this started, I thought, I'm going to time how long it takes for them to say who they're talking about. Because they were just talking about him and his childhood and this and that. And I thought, oh, well, they must be talking about El Messias since uh, he's Jim Mitchell's son. No. They ended up talking about Chris. So the entire segment ends, and all we hear is Chris 
Chris Masters? Chris Jericho. <laughs> no, Chris Abyss, it turns out. Tanae told us afterwards. So uh, that 30 se- uh, second segment right there was everything that was wrong with this company. It was 30 seconds. What the hell did it was? <sighs> Missile Who cares? Said, Missile says something. He like, asked a question, and then it just ended. Yes. Because that, that was horrible. And then came the coup de grace. <laughs> the triple crown of bullshit was this period. P.D. Williams with Crystal and Matt Morgan. P.D. is now shirtless. He's jacked to the gills. And uh, he is now Maple Leaf Muscle. He did an Arnold impersonation, which was so horrible. So fucking awful, he wouldn't stop. He talked about Crystal having a crush on Kurt Angle. I have absolutely no idea what he was talking about. Matt said he was great as he looked down on this man, who literally is shorter than I am. Yeah, yeah. And Matt Morgan is seven feet tall. Let me paint this picture, everyone. There's The left-hand side of the screen was Matt Morgan's head barely fitting in the top all the way down to his waist. In the middle was Crystal, this average-sized human. And then way down the lower right-hand corner was like, Petey Williams' eyes up. That's <laughs> it. Yes. This was a poor way to make him look like a big, strong guy. As I noted yesterday, I think they put Matt Morgan on a box to make him look even bigger. And then dug a hole for Petey to stand in. Yeah, he was on his knees. So then we had Angle coming out with his uh, crew. I don't know what happened. I think he took his briefcase. Uh, Angle came out with his crew and called Christian out, and they had the longest fucking segment I've ever seen, made worse by the fact that there were 18 million camera switches. I command everybody listening to this right now. And keep in mind, I am the same man that commanded all of you to buy ROH Man Up, which you did, and you were happy, and thus um, you owe me. I command everybody to watch this goddamn show next week and just look at how many times the camera switches. You only have to watch, like, one segment. Here's, here's what I did during, during the main event. Just every time the camera switches start to count. One, two, three. You will almost never make it to four. You will never, ever make it to five. Yes. It's usually one, two, one. One, no, it's one, usually two. one, 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 one. I mean, there was literally at one point on the show a camera switch like every half a second. Yeah, there, there was a four-second span with about six camera switches. And this is not even during action. This was during this interview here. They, like, had five cameras set up around the ring, and they went... Switching from camera to camera, just one at a time. Like, camera one, camera two, camera three, camera four, camera five. Camera one, camera two, camera three, over and over and over again. Meanwhile, all these guys were arguing. I think they were arguing about becoming a team. My big question through this 30-minute segment was, who cares? What are the benefits of being a team? Who in, in, the, in the living world could care that these people are or are not going to be a team? A, a team for what? A team against who? Who cares? Well, I do not know. Honestly, all I got out of this was at one point Christian turned to Tomko, and he said he used to be nothing but a prison guard until I found you in prison. <laughs> what the hell? Uh, maybe he was going to say no to drugs. Was he <laughs> on tour? <laughs> he could have. It, most, most people don't speak at prisons. Christian may have been going to speak about wrestling. Apparently he was. I don't care. Then, to the back. I think they teamed up. They teamed up, and Kurt said that Christian could be the leader, which, of course, didn't last till the end of the show. Uh, some promos. Uh, Steiner got his briefcase. Team 3D and Havoc versus Jay Lethal and the Machine Guns in a ladder match for possession of the X Division title, although not the championship. Yeah. Cut to the chase. Havoc got the belt in this ladder match, but Jay Lethal is still the champion. So we've got a man who's the champion and a man who has possession of the belt. Seriously. And there was a fuck finish. Yeah. If that's not confusing enough, they had to have someone get the belt and then a ref bump yeah. in a ladder match. Yeah. And then the, the wrong winner got the belt. So, yes, by TNA rule, he has the belt, but he is not the champion. Let's move on. Chris Abyss. There was another Mitchell segment. He said that uh, next week he wanted Chris to come out and tell the world the secret that only he and I know. I could have sworn that we already heard the secret, which was that his father was shot or some such bullshit. But apparently there's another secret that not a single person on the earth could care about. Secret number two. Except for the, the angry, irate TNA fans who've been probably spending all day writing a Lance Storm after he wrote a commentary last night and buried TNA. We'll talk to him about that in a couple of weeks. Uh, then we had uh, Cornette telling Morgan to go get all the briefcases. Uh, as far as I know, the show ended and he didn't have them. Who cares? The, 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 the key here was Cornet was unaware that the briefcase holders had their briefcases because he said, and I quote, 
I've been in meetings all day. I have not watched the show. Jim Cornette, the TNA commissioner, scheduled a bunch of meetings during Impact. What better time? <laughs> Seriously. I, so I guess y'all knows it sucks. Ten-man tag, Joe's team versus Angle's team. No one really cares who's on either team. I guarantee that right now. And if you do, we've got results on our website. But uh, the comedy here was everybody did a dive except Nash, who mocked people doing dives. And then in the end, Nash got the pin. Awesome man. <laughs> I didn't make the connection. Match was acceptable. That's about it. And I, I, was, uh, I was counting, doing the, the, the counting the camera angles like we talked about, and suddenly I had to stop counting because Samoa Joe and Tomko were in the ring, and holy crap, they were great. Yeah. It went 40 seconds or so, but it was great. Yes. Other than that, shit show. That's it for the review. I have nothing more I want to talk about. The, the show went off the air. We still, we still, it has now been four days, we still don't know... Who won the Battle Royal? No one cares. Paper, you, you We've won't already know. wasted a half hour of our lives on this. Let's move on now. You're getting angry again, Brian. <laughs> no, I'm just moving on, so I don't have to talk about it anymore. To the back! I guess we must speak of impact. <clears throat> I was trying to just... Your opinion? ...bring some jollity into this show before we actually had to discuss this program. As everybody knows, I lost my mind last week, and... I think you came to your senses. I determined that what I needed to do was enjoy the show, no matter what. And so, there were a lot of suggestions on the board, and one of them was actually a, a fabulous suggestion. The person said, what you need to do is pretend that the goal of impact is to make no money. <laughs> the goal of the promotion is to do no buys. So every time they do something stupid, you give them great praise. And every time they do something good, you bury them. And I thought, that's fucking brilliant. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to play TNA No Buys. So the goal of this program is to turn viewers away and make no money. Yes. Okay. So we're going to look at it as a success. Unfortunately, the problem was, as, as the show got going, I realized, you know, I'm actually enjoying the show. It pains me to say that, but I am enjoying Impact this week, and it's really putting a fucking damper on my game here. <laughs> so I wrote this report that I guess you'll all just have to read. I don't know what the fuck it is, and I'm not rewriting it. Who cares? Seriously, who cares? Well, if it's feeling better, I hated the show. <laughs> I don't know how you could have hated the show. This show was filled with so much greatness. Well, well, I, well, I remember we, we discussed this very briefly. I, I mentioned I hated the show, and you thought it was, said it was better than last week. And on the drive home, I thought... There was more good stuff on this show than the show last week. There was nothing of any value last week. <laughs> yes, there Maybe was a single thing. I can't. <laughs> there were there were there were moments of, of good quality television on this episode of Impact, but I cannot say that about last week's show. When you said that this show was was bad, I was just gobsmacked. I was like, did he fucking watch the show last week that caused me to lose my mind? And he thinks this is a fucking bad show. This fucking show had the briefcase gimmick with music. And you just label that as good. <laughs> this fucking show had Kevin Nash to being Kevin Nash. That was good. That was awesome. This show this show had great stuff on it, unfortunately. It pains me to say that. And I'm not playing the game here. All right, let's review it. I'll, I'll do what I can. So, we had the opening video package, which made no sense. <laughs> I watched Impact every week, and I had no idea what the, this, this video recap was about. So, this is a success, then. It is a no-buy success. This is a no-buy success. Followed immediately by another no-buy success, wherein they pen the crowd, as you've seen in every wrestling show forever. I said, this is TNA, and so I'm not making this up. They were cutting to the crowd shot so quickly, I couldn't read any of the signs. Yes. They, success! They panned so quickly, you could not read what anybody had written when they asked them to hold their signs up for TV. Oh, what jackasses. So, Christian cut a promo. And uh, I was getting ready to just fucking bury this. Because he goes, Last week, people said I got what I deserved on Impact. And I thought, You ain't going to say what happened, did you, are you? Because I don't remember. You're just going to come out here and you're going to talk like we all remember what the fuck happened last week. To my amazement, Christian explained that last week on Impact, he had been sucker punched by Kurt Angle and beaten down by Robert Roode. And I was like, I remember that! Amazing. Wow. This completely amazed me. So, um, anyway, he told us he was a prick, and he said tonight there was going to be a tag match. Robert Roode and Angle versus Christian and a mystery partner. 
TNA wasn't big enough for him and Kurt. Out came Kurt and Robert Roode, and he, they agreed to the match, and, and uh, Angle said, good luck finding a partner because everybody in this company hates you. And he said they were at war, and then uh, Robert Roode was yelling and screaming, and uh, all I remember is during this, Robert Roode was, like, being really great. <laughs> and I thought, unsuccessful. He is an awfully great entertainer, yes, it is. Christian came out and he said, I, some people said I, des- I deserved that beat down last week. Don said, he really should have seen it coming. <laughs> and I thought, what the hell is this been talking about? What were the clues? And then it hit me like a ton of bricks to the face. It's fucking TNA. <laughs> Everyone gets beat up by their partners all the time. Yeah. He, in fact, should have seen this coming. So talk down up to Don, he was right. Let's see. So, yes, Christian vowed that uh, people called her a prick and it was true. And he wasn't changing. He was setting his ways. He was going to be a prick forever. He was defiantly vowing to be a prick and, and, and to stand up to oppression. And it was a strange, it was the kind of, you know, the kind of rebel badass stuff that someone like maybe Austin would have done, except that no one cared about Christian. They booed and chanted, you suck. So I thought, wow, that's the worst face turn I ever saw. So the crowd's booing Christian. Angle comes out. He is also booed. And I thought, this is just a disaster. <laughs> now, I will say the one thing. When this promo ended... I knew exactly what the main event of this program was going to be. That's a rarity in TNA, and for the purposes of this review, I must dub this a failure. Yes. But if they were, if their goal, well, let's just move on. So oh, there, there was one more thing. I almost neglected this. Rude has the mic, and he's 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 cutting this promo, and he's awesome. But he tells Christian, basically, you're not the boss of me anymore. <laughs> they were together for like three weeks. Yes. Why should we care? We don't. <laughs> no, 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 we don't. At no all. lies. No money. So then we had an AJ Tomko segment where Tomko said they needed to choose sides in this war. They actually reviewed the history of Feast for Fire, believe it or not, <laughs> a recap segment. Then we had the generic blonde chick interviewing Petey Williams. Jack to his gills, pumping up, jumping up and down. He said the four dudes with briefcase were going to grapple. The winner was had the option of either keeping his briefcase, trading it for somebody else's, or... Handing it to the office for fifty thousand dollars, and he said, fifty thousand is nothing to him, because in the world of bodybuilding, he can win Mr. Saskatchewan and get a tenth of that. He said he was a hundred ten percent certain that his briefcase had the world title shot in it. And uh, by the way, Petey's supposed to be a baby face for all you want. That's right? impossible. No, um, that cannot be true. I've actually got. A TNA script. Really? A legit one. It must be eight inches thick. I will email it to you, and you will laugh till you cry. We will discuss this in the newsletter this coming week and and, uh, and more, but it's money. So, yes. First of all... I'm not done yet. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed, sorry. So, uh, I have to say that <laughs> Petey Williams entertained me in every single thing he did this week. It's so goofy... It's no buys. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. No one's paying to watch him do his lame Arnold impression. No one is paying a single dime for this. But God damn it entertained me. So that's that's half the battle. He entertained me. I turned the corner. He entertained me greatly in a match. This promo is lame. The Arnold Schwarzenegger gimmick is lame. Although at least the interviewer chick, <laughs> unlike every other interviewer chick in the world, she knows that something is lame and rolls her eyes at it. She does. So that was good. But, uh... Yes, uh, and also, you're welcome, Brian, for explaining the stipulations that later matched you, because you had no idea what was going I on. I did have no idea. You were actually. lost at sea. <laughs> I had no idea. PDVG, Scott Steiner, Chris Daniels. <clears throat> we had a pose down between Scott Steiner and P. Williams the day the Mitchell Report came out. That was awesome. So And Hermie Sadler on commentary, which was also great. So, uh, anyway, they had the match, and P hit the Canadian Destroyer on Daniels, and then Steiner picked him up and gave him a belly-to-belly for the pin. It was Steiner's turn to make a decision. He said 50 grand was a lot of money, which he could share with his freaks out there, but he wanted his world title shot, shitty baby face. And so he chose Petey's briefcase because Petey had said with 110% certainty that he had a world title shot in his briefcase. So, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, this was, in fact, a fun match. Uh, The first thing I wrote down when I looked at these four men was, what the hell is P.D. Williams going to do with Scott Steiner and B.G. James? And the answer is, he's going to be awesome with Scott Steiner. He had the, had the as you noted, the pose down, which Scott Steiner won. And then P.D. began to steal Scott Steiner's moves right in front of him. That was entertaining stuff. And, and this is a actual fun match. Therefore, failure. <laughs> we got uh, 
After commercial, it was time to open a briefcase. Petey got to go first, said he might vomit. Briefcase was open, and he got the TNA heavyweight title shot. So Scott had turned down 50 grand and lost a world title shot. Dipshit. <laughs> he was a stupid man, yes. This, this was Brian. I know you've never seen the show Deal or No Deal. Deal or No Deal. It looks exactly like this, yeah. complete with the wacky lighting and the stupid dramatic music. Here's yeah. the thing. I hate that show. <laughs> I don't want to watch the show. I sure as hell don't want to watch it on wrestling. I do. If, if I wanted to watch Deal or No Deal, I would go watch Deal or No Deal. Maybe I'm weird that way. It's funny on wrestling. They should have done like, uh, it should have been like on The Price is Right where they had the mountain climber. Now, that was a fucking game. <laughs> and they could have used Petey. If they had Petey Williams playing Plinko, <laughs> that I would have watched. Uh, this was great. So, anyway. Then we had uh, Crystal interviewing Kaz. And he talked about Chuck Norris and <laughs> Relic. This is so and then this became the stupidest thing I've ever seen, which made it awesome. Because it was a true... Kaz was basically uh, talking, and Christian came up and commanded him to be his partner tonight. He basically said, you owe me for putting you over. <laughs> so, almost exactly what he said, yeah. And Kaz said, let's not rush into things. Let's pray. Close your eyes. And when Christian closed his eyes, the baby face Kaz ran off in fear. Do you think I'm kidding? Pure shit. <laughs> Success. Yes, this was undoubtedly complete success. I also like when he called Relic Darth Maul and then said, oops, I mean Relic, to make sure we all got the joke, ha-ha. Uh-huh. This was a horrible segment and such a raging success. Relic and Kaz opened up, no shit, with Don West telling us that Relic was killer spelled backwards. Why is this so important that we're told it every week? <laughs> I've got to get somebody on the show to explain this to me. <laughs> they won't enjoy Relic unless they know it's killer spelled backwards. Why is it so important? <laughs> Fools! Who could watch this show? So they went to commercial during this match. <clears throat> this one. <clears throat> and Mike Tanay said, and I quote, More with Relic and Kaz when we come back. <laughs> and I was going to say viewers around the, sh- the viewers around the country turned the channel, but the truth is they weren't watching <laughs> They left the TV off. More with Relic and Kaz. They actually had a decent match, and then when it was over, Black Rain hit the ring with his mouse and uh, put it in a bag, and then put the bag on Kaz's head. And then it was wiggling. <laughs> okay. And it was to the back. Or to the back, okay. Lost in all the silliness that we've had with Relic over the last six weeks, he ain't bad. There's nothing wrong with Relic in the ring. I like watching Relic. So they had this match, and it was, I enjoyed it, and so I thought, huh, failure. Then Black Rain came out, as you noted. He uh, took advantage of the tired cat, Frankie Kazarian. He sat Frankie Kazarian down in front of him, and he grabbed his spike. The darkness falls, as Don West is always sure to have it. It can't just be Black Rain spike. It has to be the darkness falls. He holds the spike up over his head. Frankie responds by looking up at the spike, holding his hands up, and waving no, no, no. He did not try to run away. <laughs> he did not try to block the spike. He did not grab Dustin's leg and pull him down. No. He had all these options at his disposal, but he was apparently so paralyzed by fear that he could merely sit there and accept the spike into his forehead. And then there was, the, the, as you mentioned, the bullshit with the mouse, <laughs> where I, they put the mouse in the bag, they put the bag on his head, and Don West, or maybe it's today, one of them said, the rat is going to work inside the bag. So apparently it ate his eyes. So this went from a mild failure to an epic success. Now, and let's speak of this next segment. I know Flair Pindy is listening, who spent money on a shout-out Monday to talk about how sexist I was. Called herself my former lover. Get real. Flair Pindy, listen to me. I know you didn't watch the pay-per-view. I know you probably don't even watch Impact. I don't even know if you can in the land that you come from. But the point is, I was right. When I had the epiphany that Velvet Sky and Angelina Love had the gimmick that they were amateur porn stars, I was so fucking correct. No one believed me. Maybe a few people did. They made it abundantly clear in this promo. They cut a promo here 
Which, by the way, was incomparably bad. <laughs> Can't even... Nothing on this show even came close to how bad this was. But they did an interview, and they revealed that they were, in fact, amateur porn stars. They said they had experience in hotels and beds across America. Yes, that is exactly what they said. I was so fucking right here, it's not even funny. Yeah. Then, then, then they I saw this before anybody. And they had to get this match over with in a hurry because they had an appointment later. They were going to boink someone. <laughs> yes. So, they are, in fact, amateur porn. Uh, well, perhaps they pay. They may be professional porn stars. They may be. They may be. Of this, they do pornography. Then we had an interview with Jackie, James Storm, Robert Rude, and Tracy. Where this was awesome. Jackie was snookered and uh, called the two amateur porn stars we had just referenced two bimbo whores. <laughs> she poured beer down Tracy's top. Tracy went nuts, but Rude told her to stop being a bitch because you never talk down to a veteran. I laughed. That was a great moment. I also like, uh, as Jackie was being a, a, a drunken fool, James Strong said, that's what I like about her, that and them boobies. <laughs> and then after she poured beer down Tracy's shirt, she immediately leapt in, she being Jackie, leapt in the air, bounced their chests together, and James Storm announced, that's called the booby bounce. <laughs> that move has a name. So between the beer and the breasts, this segment was an easy thumbs up and thus a failure. Jackie Moore and Miss Brooks against Team Prawn. It's her new name. Jackie worked the match drunk, so she is truly a veteran. Beat the shit out of porn chicks. And uh, just Velvet looked like she was being killed. And Tracy ended up bumping into Jackie. Sky rolled her up for the pin. I had way too much fun watching this match. And uh, I was going to give it a fail, but then uh, afterwards Jackie and Tracy got into a fight. Because everyone on TNA must fight with their partner. Yes. Robert Root came out, told Jackie to hit the bricks. Tracy was smitten like he'd saved her, but then Root cut a promo on her, calling her stupid and useless. And then Charmel came out and, and was jaw-jacking with Robert Root, and he started screaming at her and threatened to beat her up, and then Booker made the save. And it actually all made sense in the end, so I can't bury it. But um, Or it will make sense in the end. It didn't necessarily make sense completely today. But in the end, it will make sense, so uh, there you go. The porn stars, uh, they do have cool music. And I mentioned this because on Monday I said, boy, Jim might have had cool music tonight. And then the next day, somebody emailed it to me. So thank you very much, Ian. It's cool. I appreciate that. Somebody sent me the porn stars' music. It's cool. So then, uh, as you know, they're doing the post-match stuff. And, and, and like you say, the match was there. I could not rate it a success or a failure. I could merely watch and, and observe. And then the partner started the fight at the end, which makes it an automatic success because I am so sick of that in TNA. And Don West said, it's hard to watch. And he was right. It's hard to watch this shit every week. I'm so tired of the partners fighting. And then the Booker and Star Charmel stuff came out, and that was fine. And we had a segment that, please, please, somebody get a drop of this entire segment. Christian went to talk to Nash, who was napping. Yes. Kevin Nash was asleep during impact. Kevin Nash showed up at the building... The tapings began, and he fell asleep. He started reading the paper and fell asleep with the paper on top of him. I love this man. So, oh, it gets better. Christian wanted him to be his partner. And Nash said, well, I'm sorry, I'm busy tonight. And Christian said, busy doing what? And Nash says, what I do best, sit around, do nothing, and get paid. Ha, ha, ha. It was, ha, 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 was the part that made it. He laughed at himself. He laughed at the, the station he had earned in life. Yes. Of being paid to sit around and do nothing. I can't, I can't even begin to do justice to this, so we need to get a drop. So then uh, Christian knew where to get, wanted to know where to get a partner, and Nash said, down there. And uh, Christian said, down where? And Nash said, down there. And he pointed and at his crotch and cackled <laughs> and laughed like a... a he like a he was going to fall pervert. over. Yeah. He did, and then he just kind of stumbled out of the room. That's as you just stumbled and spilled water all over us. <laughs> You're trailing him and Nash here. You're cackling and spilling shit. This was the best segment in the history of Impact. Yes, and then Christian, the, the, the interviewer chick was laughing at Kevin, and Christian pointed out to her, you were at an 11 year old with gray hair. So that was great. I should also note that uh, Christian came in here. He, he walked into Nash's room, and he woke Nash up. He wanted, of course, to be Nash's friend, and so he tried to impress him by singing the NWO theme song, and he failed. <laughs> I realized Christian was often working Monday nights during the Monday Night Wars. He may have never actually watched Nitro, but he does not know how to do the NWO theme song. So thankfully Kevin Nash was there. He corrected it. Everything was okay. 
This segment was, in fact, awesome. We watched it about five times, laughing harder and harder every time. This was an epic failure of the, of the greatest degree, because this is a segment that was so great that not only would anyone turn away, this is the kind of thing that would make you turn to your friends and say, you've got to watch Impact tonight. You must see the bit with Christian and Kevin Nash. It's awesome. Brian has sufficiently dried off the desk. Disaster appears to have been averted. Should we go on with the show? We'll go on with the show. Jim Mitchell came out. He was uh, looking sharp this evening. He came out of the ring, and he immediately called out Chris Abyss. Abyss came out. The fans chanted, let's go Abyss, or Abyss, or come on Abyss, or something. But the point is, they did not sing the Abyss song. I missed the Abyss song. If you're listening and you go to the Impact Zone, if you're not going to these shows, you must sing the Abyss song, and you must get the other fans to join in with you. There are a few things in TNA that made me happy. The Abyss song is one of them. Please bring that back. So Mitchell, uh, he went ran I've down. I've never noticed until right now how much you yell during the show. <laughs> you're you're an inch away from a microphone, and you're yes. screaming and ranting and raving. Would you like me to go back to my original monotone days? Well, you, no. Okay, then. <laughs> Wait a second. Yes. You've only got extremely loud or monotone. My volume is on or off. Jeez. There's no degree of control. All right, will you go on? All right, then. Well, so, yes. Mitchell, he called Abyss. Out of, Abyss came down. He wanted Abyss to take a seat. Abyss refused. Mitchell said, what, am I going to beat you up? Abyss still refused. So Mitchell said, fine. Mitchell pointed out that he and Abyss were family. He pointed out that over a year ago, over a year ago, they had revealed the secret that Abyss watched his mother shoot his father. He now wanted Abyss to reveal the rest of the secret. Abyss refused and said, you do it. And Abyss said, no, they won't believe me because of Sting. Which is kind of an odd moment there because Sting is, for the time being, gone. What are you talking about? Abyss didn't say a single word during this entire thing. He, he said he gestured that he wanted Mitchell to say it. And Mitchell said, I can't say it. They won't believe me. That part is true. So, anyway. Hold on a second. Yeah. You're boring me. Fine. <laughs> and this segment sucked. They did a bunch of shit. And then Messias came out and beat up Abyss and hit with a bunch of unprotected chair shots. And I decided this company deserves to die. Fail! Yeah, Abyss, a his, legit fail. Abyss's hands were tied behind his back. So uh, I, I cannot give a thumbs down to any segment with Jim Mitchell doing a promo. So Well, I gave a thumbs down to this one. It, it's he could have fucking given a promo in Latin, and I would have given it a thumbs down. Thumbs this down for the super violence. We had Booker cutting a promo backstage where I wanted to beat Robert Roode's ass. And then uh, Christian snuck in and said, ah, well, you know, we've never seen eye to eye, but I need a partner tonight. And and it happens to be with Robert Roode. And Booker said, nope, I'll never be a partner and stormed off. So write that down, kids. Chris Harris came out and bitched that uh, Chris never asked him to be the partner. And uh, they're clearly building a feud with him and Angle. God knows why. The most boring fucking guy on the entire show. And uh, meanwhile, James Storm, the uh, the Shawn Michaels of this this Rockers breakup duo, is is stuck. Uh, I don't know what he was doing tonight in that stupid. Uh, I don't know what he He's was drinking beer with Jackie. <clears throat> drinking beer with Jackie. Should be doing more than that. So, anyway, we had uh, Booker T and Chris Harris, which Booker T won clean with the axe kick. <laughs> Hell of a career for that uh, Chris Harris. And then Mike Sine alerted us. It was Booker T post-match celebration time, which it was. He celebrated after his match. Yes, indeed. Time for the second briefcase to be opened. BG James got to go. He got the tag title match. Morad said, you and your partner, Kip James, must be happy. And BJ said, my partner has yet to be determined. Because, of course, you guessed it. They're fighting. They are fighting. And that makes this segment, Brian, a success. It drove viewers away and made no money. I also, I also like that they gave away the world title shot in the first of these briefcase dealies. So now no one, because no one cares about the exhibition title or the tag title, now they can only lose. Well, I mean, they figured that the main event was being fired. I guess so. Jay Lethal and Johnny Devine in a lumberjack strap match. Lumberjacks were uh, wearing lumberjack shirts. We had a heel out numbered 8-1. to one. Lethal pinned him, and uh, I noticed during this match, I finally figured it out. They always put a commercial in the middle of these five-minute matches. You'll get one minute, a three-minute commercial break, and another one minute. Because they don't want wrestling on this show. The whole goal is to have no wrestling on this show. So when they have to have wrestling, they put a commercial to cut out three minutes of a five-minute match. It's actually rather uh, fascinating when you watch it. But um, regardless, this was which would make it a success in the game we're playing. Because why would you buy a pay per view to get wrestling matches when this is the shit that you see for free? That's also true. I have no answer for you. So <clears throat> afterwards, 
All the X Division guys beat on Divine. Yes, they tortured him. <laughs> he did. Ten men got in the ring. They take their they took their beaten foe. They held him and took turns lashing him. This was torture. This is frowned on by the UN. Then the Team 3D came out and Divine ran for his life. So it was now eight on two. Advantage baby faces. Team 3D bailed, which caused Don West to say, and I quote. You know they didn't have enough stones to go in there to face the entire X Division. They're pussies because they would not take an eight-on-two fight. <laughs> this show sucks so much, Dick. <laughs> it's so bad. It's so incomprehensibly bad. It's there was funny. actually a statement before this that I hated more than, even more than this, Dustin Rhodes was cutting a promo. Oh, not God. Black Rain, <laughs> Dustin Rhodes. Okay, it was very, very short. He accused Black Rain of drinking his milk. Suddenly, Cav showed up and give, began to pummel him, and then they cut away. Yes. I thought there was nothing more to it than that. This was a monumental success. <laughs> Such shit. God. It is, it's actually amazing that you even bother putting something like that on the air. You know what I mean? Yeah. Why bother? But you filmed that. In fact, this 23 seconds of television right here is going to make us so much money. It's going to entertain people. No. No one's going to like it. No one's going to pay for it. It's just going to make people like me angry. So I have an open last briefcase. Daniel's got to go. He said he'd given his heart and soul to the company, and he was confident that the X Division title shot would be his. So I understand he was in a no-win situation. He didn't want the X title, and uh, he didn't want to be fired. Although he did say that there's no way that Jim Cornette would have the balls to fire him. He said Petey lied to him, and there's no lying <laughs> in wrestling. That's right. So I had to get the briefcase back from Petey. Before I said they had extra security to escort the fired man out of the building. Never to wrestle in TNA again. <clears throat> So they open it up, and Daniels uh, Daniels was fired. When we say fired, there was a giant card the size of the briefcase that said, Fired, F-I-R-E-D, exclamation point, all in giant red letters. They need a streamer to fly out of it. They should have, or fireworks. Whee! So, crowd sang the goodbye song. He wept. Yes. They dragged him out, and as he was being dragged away, all of a sudden we heard, To the back! To the back! This is, there was more to come, but yes. Here was... That was the end of his career. That was the end of his career. Here's Chris Daniels, been in, TNA, been in TNA since day one, since, I believe, match one. I believe he was in the first TNA match of all time. And, uh, yes, it was such a big deal when he was fired that the crowd sang the na-na-na, hey-hey, goodbye song, and then into the back. Sucks to be you, Chris. Bad. I also like, Scott Steiner said, when he said that Petey lied to him, and he said he, he had the case of the title shot, whereas, in fact, Scott did, and uh, Petey had it, Scott vowed to get the case back. So you're telling me that after the Battle Royal and then two more weeks of impact to see who won the damn title match, we still don't know. Scott Steiner still has a chance to recover the briefcase from P.D. Williams and get his title match back. This show fucking sucks a dick. <laughs> Why does that anger you of all things? It, 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 it's the accumulation of everything. Who it's, cares now? This should, this should last till next year's <laughs> no. November pay-per-view. No, this show angered me. <laughs> Just keep going on and on forever. See, now you're acting irrational. I was irrational I don't, I don't deny week. that. I do not deny that. I, now, see, I think you were acting rationally last week. No. Last week you made sense for the first time in a year. No. Last last week I, I got so angry that I ended up getting sick. That's bad. Oh, please. So, then we had, uh, oh, by the way, I'd just like to note, as far as just the stupidity of TNA as an organization in storyline, as soon as the briefcase opened and it said fired, I just sat there and I thought, if this was real, why would a worldwide pro wrestling organization want to book a match where any one of their stars on the entire roster, completely at a random, would have to be fired? Yes. It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my life. <laughs> in storyline, they're retarded. The gimmick of TNA, the company is, they suck. Now think about this. What if like, what if like I did a contest on the website, and uh, it was going to come down to two people, and one person was going to win, like, a free year subscription, and one person was just going to be canceled and they could never sign up again. So I'd lose money on the deal d double. I'd have to sure, give a free yes. year, and I'd lose out on the money on the guy that gets canceled. Who the fuck would ever do that? I don't the know. answer is TNA. <laughs> they thought this was a brilliant idea. At random, a man will be fired, and it ended up being Chris Daniels. What if it had been their champion? 
realize he wasn't in the match, but come on now. Just idiocy. Yes. So sucks. Angle and Robert Roode versus Christian and himself since he had no partner. I'm going to ask this question again because I didn't get an answer yet. Is Spike TV fucking up repeatedly? Or did this show, is, is Impact regularly going off the air late now and I need to start setting my DVR? Because it's now been, I think, two weeks in a row where at about the uh, seven minutes till the end of the show, somewhere around there, they've uh, gone off the air. I have no idea what happened in this match. They beat on AJ, or they beat on Christian forever. Nobody ended up coming out to be his partner, I believe, is what ended up happening. They pinned him, but I don't know. Because, it took them long enough to get there. Um, Angle was doing German suplexes in the DVR cutoff. I, I don't know why. Somebody help me out here. God intervened and saved me. But again, it, it's not like um, it's not like I care when it's on the Ultimate Fighter finale or Raw. Right. <laughs> if you, you would snap. No, the show ended and I deleted it. There, there was a moment of confusion and hesitation, and then you shrugged and went, oh, well. Yeah. I took it as a sign from God. Thank you, God, for not making me watch any more of this. Yes. We had a 2 one handicap match with the, the the guy in the handicap situation facing two men with the guy who earlier on the show had vowed to be a prick and said he was better than all the fans, and so they hated him. You made me stunned, but there was not a lot of heat for this. No. And also, th- this was actually where you made the observation, because they got the heat on Christian during the break. And, and, and I, by this point, after two hours of bullshit, I flipped. I, I screamed, why did they get the heat during the break? And you made it very clear. They hate wrestling. <laughs> they don't want any wrestling on the show. So no matter how many stupid segments they have to take a commercial between, they got to take a commercial during all the matches. Yes. So while there was great, su- there was great stuff in the show in Christian and Nash, and there's some other good stuff like Game Storm, I think it was one of the matches I liked, on the, on the whole, this show was a gigantic success. <laughs> I give the show two thumbs up. Well, that would be a lie. I give it one thumbs up. I can't justify two. Thumbs up, TNA. Good job this week. Fuck off, TNA. Die. Now fix your stupid programming so that the DVR doesn't cut off. What if I miss something cool? What if I miss more Kevin Nash? Take it back! We're live! In Gainesville, Georgia, home of the phenomenal AJ Styles, where AJ has been in seclusion, locked up in his own room, a prisoner of his own home for the entire week, as the entire world awaits the answer of AJ Styles pertaining to whose side he's going to be on in final resolution, Kurt Angler or Christian Cage. There's only one man who knows, and that is AJ Styles himself. Hopefully tonight in Gainesville, Georgia, we will get that answer from the man himself. Cue the pyro and ballyhoo! Woo! We've got the TNA Impact script right here, and we're going to try and bring some excitement to the show by reading it tonight. We're going to do some acting here on the Brian V Show. Indeed, indeed. It will be a fun time. You will see how talented we really are. That's right. We don't have much to talk about otherwise. Just the worst impact in history, according to Dave Meltzer, caused him to completely <laughs> lose his mind. It was very bad. It, it was, was a very bad television program. You know what, though? It didn't bother me. I, I don't know why. It was. It was so beyond the realm of... I don't even know how to explain it. It was so beyond anything I've ever seen that it was just two hours of, of entertainment to me. I will. Th- There's a point in the show, I guess I'd have to, by definition, call it the worst thing I ever saw in a wrestling show, <laughs> but I was laughing so hard at all yes. the bullshit. Yes. I, was, I was in tears. And even the, the, the only time I've ever laughed harder in my life was, when the zombies show up in ECW. <laughs> and even that was supposed to be funny. Yes. This was not intended to make me laugh, and I was howling. Yeah. I was clutching my sides and weeping with joy. It was so goddamn funny. <laughs> it involved a barbed wire Christmas tree. <laughs> it involved a barbed wire. <laughs> it, it involved, I will say this, it involved a barbed wire Christmas tree. It did not peak with the barbed wire Christmas tree. There was more lunacy to follow. This was the worst television program. It was just so phenomenally bad. That was, without question, the worst segment I ever saw. <laughs> without, But was it really? I mean, seriously. If something brings you that much laughter, could it really be the worst of all time? And I don't, I don't, I don't know. That, that's a, I didn't get angry a single time watching this show. <laughs> I, it was all such a level of stupid that I, I, I just laughed throughout the entire show. I don't, I don't know if I got very angry. I got annoyed. My, my 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 humor and joy didn't last the entire two hours. No, I've been I've been so much angrier. There have been so many impacts that I've felt have been worse than this show, <laughs> just because I don't know. Because I guess here's what it might be. Usually I get mad when it feels like they're trying. <laughs> this just felt like 
I don't know what they were trying to do, but they could not possibly have been trying to put on a good show. <laughs> See, I actually, I, I, I think there are points here where they thought, there, there are points where they were not trying to be necessarily good, but I thought they were trying to be funny. That's undoubtedly true. And it was so not funny, I was insulted. <laughs> I was I was insulted they thought I would laugh at this shit. It was such an epic fail. That it was such, that is how to describe the show. Teeny Impact, epic fail. That's, that's it, that is. That's Impact. Yeah, we have the script here where we have the, the, the title of the January 3rd episode, or whatever, and it says something like, kicking off the New Year gauntlet style, or something along those lines. This was Teeny Impact, epic fail. Okay. Oh, God. This script, by the way, is enormous. All right, open it up. Open the script? Yeah, we're going to just start right off the bat here. I'll play Jim Cornette. Are you on the first page now? No, this is uh, uh, clearly not. There's no Cornette on that page. In ring with Jim Cornette and Matt Morgan. All right, I'm going to be, all right. You're Cornette. I will be Joe. There's a lot of, there's a lot of characters here, so. <clears throat> all right, here we go. This is Jim Cornette. Well, as always, TNA is going to start the new year off with a bang, as tonight, for the first time ever in wrestling history, there will be four gauntlets on the show. Determine the official rankings of the year in the knockout division, the tag team division, the X division, and the heavyweight division. In conjunction with that, final rev- rev- uh, resolution is shaping up to go down in TNA history as one of the greatest pay-per-views of all time. Before I run down the entire card, let me first announce a match that was signed during this past week. Robert Roode has asked and been granted a mixed tag team match at Final Resolution where he and Miss Brooks will team up against Booker T and his lovely wife, Charmel. Final Resolution will be headlined by the heavyweight title match with Kurt Angle and Christian Cage. From there, to Joe's music. Yes. It says Samoa Joe M and E. I'm going to get this music and entrance. Yes. And then it says in all capital letters, in parentheses, babyface. <laughs> And after watching TNA Impact Epic Fail, dear God, is the baby face and heel notation necessary? Oh, yeah. I have no idea who's good and evil on the show. No. Cornette, I want you to explain to me how you can announce a TNA pay-per-view card without Samoa Joe's name on it. Samoa Joe has done nothing but give everything he has to this company for the past three years. You talk about a glass ceiling in TNA, Cornette. Where's the glass ceiling, huh? Where is it? Why do I keep banging my head against nothing but concrete pillars? Where's my title shot, huh? Where? Where's my contract that's worth more than the papers written on? <laughs> Everyone around here gets an opportunity except Samoa Joe. Hell, you even gave that goof Scott Hall a title shot when his buddy Kevin Nash a final resolution, simply because he signed his name on the contract. <laughs> I'm glad that he shut us straight up your ass at Turning Point. You got exactly what you deserve. I don't remember any of this, by the Why way. Why does Scott Hall get a title shot? I want to know what he's talking about, his contract that's worth more than the paper it's written on. Was this supposed to be an insult? What kind of baby face comes on TV and whines all the time? There's two of them. Okay, I'm going to play Kevin Nash or Samoa Joe here. You know what, Joe? I stood by one time when you buried my friend Scott Hall in front of my face at Turning Point, but I won't do it again. You're running down a guy that has had more problems in his life than you and I combined. You have no idea why I didn't show up at Turning Point, and you have no right to open your mouth about it. I think you need to recognize your place in this business. I think you need to recognize what I have done and what you haven't done. I think you need to recognize what I'm trying to do for you. Kevin... The only thing I recognize is that it's my time, whether you like it or not. So maybe it's time for the Kevin Nashes and the Scott Halls of the world to move aside. No problem, Joe. Why don't you move me aside? Kevin steps up in Joe's face. Can't play cornet again. You know what? I'm sick and tired of everybody telling me what they want. I'm sick and tired of everybody telling me the way things are going to be. Starting tonight, it's not going to be about what's best for the individual... It's going to be about what's best for TNA. Line of the year right there. <laughs> the way I see it, we have a tag team title match at Final Resolution, and Kevin Nash is short of the partner. Joe, you want your shot at gold here in TNA? Well, concern yours, because at Final Resolution, AJ and Tom Cole will defend their tag team title belts, and it will be against Kevin Nash and Samoa Joe. TNA management has spoken now. Hit the music. There you go. Cue the calliope. Calliope in the accordion. The circus is in town. All right. Where are we here? Are you pre tape Pre-tape, Crystal Laufen with Robert Roode and Miss Brooks. I'll play the girls. Producer, Vince Russo. What a shocker. Robert Roode, Jim Cornette just announced a mixed tag that you demanded at final resolution. It's going to be you and Miss Brooks against Booker T and Charmel. That's exactly right, Crystal. If Charmel wants to step in that ring and get in my face, then let's make it official. <laughs> let's make it official and let her step in that ring. Because, Booker, let me make one thing perfectly clear. Robert Roode has no problem smacking the taste out of a woman's mouth. Well, that takes a real man to hit a woman. He's Miss Brooks now. I despise you. I despise everything about you. You despise me? I love the fact that I get under your skin that way. Let's make one thing clear. You will be my partner in Final Resolution, and you will do exactly what I say. I don't have...
have a problem with Booker T or Charmel. My problems are your problems. And if my problems aren't your problems, then Robert Roode will be your problem. You will do as I say, or you will be back in that strip club working for dollars. Dun, dun, dun. Rude you know, walks off. They need music for these. Let's see. Did another one? Yeah, let's do another one. This is uh, Brother Ray is eyeballing Crystal up and down. You'll be Brother Ray, and I'll be Devon. Should I oh, get Crystal Jesus. this time? Oh, God, look at all the people in this. All right, let's see. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> Unmat. This may be worse than Impact. I'll I'll be Crystal. Why don't we just alternate and just announce ourselves each time? I'll be Crystal. No. Um, Devon and BG James. So I need Brother Ray and also Kip. Yes. All right. <laughs> yeah, it's fitting. All right. What are you saying? Brother Ray is my role in Crystal. You know what, Brother Ray? I know this is my job and this is what I'm expected to do, but I don't have to stand here and take this from you week after week. Here's a microphone. Interview yourself. Storm off. What did I do? I didn't even say anything. What? She can't take a joke? And speaking of jokes, third? We're ranked third in this rankings gauntlet? This is sure, Don. I was going to say. <laughs> I'll get you DVDBR bastards. Behind the machine guns and LAX. Who voted on that? The moron fans or Cornette and the Stooge? The bottom line is, do you think it really makes a difference? Motor machine machine guns... <laughs> Black machismo, what we, this is horrible punctuation. What we start tonight, we finish the final resolution. You're done. Finished. Ultimate X, me, Brother Devon, and Little Divine have been training night and day. I've been scaling walls like Spider-Man. And my Brother Devon here, he's been climbing like Curious George. No offense. None taken. Well. <laughs> Let's play that drop again. Wow. Uh, fitting. That's going to be on Spike TV, everybody. Tune in. Yes. Boys or kids, you've fallen into the trap. Tonight, where was this with long dashes? Where's a period or a comma? Tonight, we start the fire. At final resolution, we put it out. Oh, my brother, testify. VKM and Roxy walk in and ask Brother Ray, where's Crystal? We have a scheduled interview with her. Brother Ray. I ate her. <laughs> and he hands BG the mic. Kip grabs it. That's me, right? Yeah. Good. This gives me the chance to interview you. When are you going to formally announce that I'll be your tag team partner when you take advantage of the title shot you won at Feast or Fired? I'll announce it when I'm ready to announce it. I'm still scouting. I'll give you something to scout. Scout this, you jack bleep. <laughs> Kip gives BG a crotch shot and walks off. Why does he have to be like that? Where's the laugh track? That was the whole interview! <laughs> I got a fitting drop. That night we went wrestled uh, Lawler and Dundee. When we came out, it was the first time we ever played the music. I mean, everybody was standing. And the music was Freebird. Yeah, Leonard that's why Spinner. they called us Freebirds. Well, some people may not be aware of that. Okay. Some people are going to watch this show. That Who would not be aware of that? Somebody like might be born after 1980. Are you talking about the writing team? <laughs> anyway, so yeah, when the right. third fall, and Michael has dumped his, his drawers. No, I'm past that. The oh. writing team. You probably don't know that Michael Hayes was in the free purse. Oh, God. Impact. You mean tonight's or the one from the future that we're reenacting here? The real one. We are pre-reenacting. Yeah. <laughs> show. <laughs> show opened with the scary James Earl Jones announced guy bringing off 8,000 funky matches no one had ever heard of before, including my favorite, which was, and I quote, a silent night, bloody night, match. <laughs> the amount of matches announced for tonight were a double North Pole match, a cage match, <laughs> Christmas Chaos Cage match, Santa's Workshop Street Fight, and Silent Night Bloody Night match with this. Oh, and the grab the, reindeer, grab the reindeer ladder match. Where the loser had to wear a reindeer costume. So, they were having a Christmas party somewhere. At first I thought a church, then I thought Eric's house. Apparently it was just somewhere in the impact zone. I don't know. It was actually the exact same set they used for the Thanksgiving party at Kurt Angle's house. Wow. Yes. Maybe it was at Kurt's house then. Who knows? A couple fat guys there. 
a girl Eric said was his sister, and then a bushwhacker showed up, and everyone did the bushwhacker walk. You have summed up everything. Um, that's what happened. There were two fat guys. I believe it was Fly Delta Slam. There's a woman there with a monkey. And there was a bushwhacker. Eric said he was family. Um, yes, and then the bushwhacker walk ensued. I believe that was Luke. I'm not I entirely to... sure. Call Honky and ask him. Oh, God. So, yeah, then we had, uh, uh, let's see, what do we start with? The cage match. Wait, no. Hold on a second here. <laughs> Matt Morgan came out. That's right, yes. He said Jim Cornette might not be here tonight, but he was here to run this shit while he was gone. I think he said ship, but I actually edited that myself into shit. He wished us all a Merry Christmas, and the Christmas present to us was this show. What a dick Matt Morgan turned out to be. Merry Christmas, everybody. I would have preferred a lump of coal. Rock and Rave Infection and Robert Roode and James Storm versus Scott Steiner, Booker T, LAX, eight-man tag team cage match opener. With Christmas lights on the cage. As Don West told us, thousands of Christmas lights. So what happened was... They had this match, and everybody stayed in their corner and ate legal tags. Right. It was a tag team match, you see. <laughs> Are there normally DQs in cage matches? <laughs> and when was the last time somebody got DQ'd in TNA? I don't know. <laughs> I do know that everybody abided by the tag rules politely. Until the end when it broke down into an eight-way, at which point I thought, why didn't you guys just do this at the beginning? These questions cannot be answered. Do not think too much. So everybody's in the ring running around. Christy jumped up on the apron, and the Latino took her out, the mystery Latino. And then Booker pinned Rave with a urinage, and it suddenly was to the back! I did not pay much attention to this match because I was too busy. Uh, I was focusing on Mike Tanay's announcement that the main event of the next pay-per-view would be Kurt Angle defending his title against Christian Cage. All I could think was, why? What did Christian Cage do to get a title shot? Last I remember, he lost to Kaz. Then he couldn't find anyone to team with him. And then he was in a handicap match, which, to my knowledge, he got his ass kicked in. Now, we had DVR issues. Perhaps he came back, he overcame the odds, and he beat Kurt Angle here in this uh, handicap he was match. Pinned. He, he was pinned? Yes. Well, I was going to say it would have been nice if they had shown us a replay. They, they did. didn't. There was no mention of last week's show. I, have, I still have no idea what happened in that match. So, And now I have learned that he was, in fact, pinned. Somehow getting pinned in a handicap match warrants getting a title shot on pay-per-view. Yes. Fuck you guys. <laughs> Fuck you and your asses. Please. <laughs> wow. Holy shit. So, that sucked. That sucked so hard. I also like, by the way, when the Mystery Latina came out, she yanks Christy off the apron. She rears back with the slapjack. At this point, Christy ducks. After Christy has ducked out of the way... The Latina swings at her. <laughs> Somehow this did not connect. Chrissy was almost giggling as she ran away. It was such a I don't violent blame attack. Her. Who cares? Team Prawn showed up at the Christmas party, and they were there, Flair Pimmy, to, and I quote, help service the guests. They were going to give everyone blow jobs. They are porn stars. Well, you're speculating there. It could have been hand jobs or who knows what else. Could have, could have been. I, I was wrong to uh, make that assumption. ODB arrived, headed to the bar, Awesome Kong showed up, Eric was being funny, epic fail. That's all I wrote. I, this cannot have been as bad as it actually was. This is so horrible. This is, this is what I was talking about where I thought, they want this to be funny. They, it's not. They think I will find this funny, and that pisses me off. That insults me. I'm not that dumb. Yes. Team 3D came out with Havoc. Bubba was dressed as Santa. Wished everyone Merry Christmas. Fans booed Christmas. Called out Black Machismo and the Motor City Machine Guns. Out came Midgets, because it is, in fact, 1998 still. So they got in the ring, and Bob Adams sit on his lap and tell him what he wanted for Christmas, and then he buried everybody and beat them up, and then the real Motor City Machine Guns and Lethal came out, and they said they wanted the match to take place right now. So we got Team 3D, Johnny Devine against the Motor City Machine Guns, and Jay Lethal, in a double fucking pole match. Double North Pole match. And what it was was a stipulation match to determine a stipulation of the next pay view. There was a stipulation on each pole. It was either going to be an Ultimate X match or a plate glass tables match. And whichever team got the stipulation, that's what it would be. Okay. <laughs> so there's these poles. They have Santa's on them or elves or something. They were decorated. 
And, uh, yes, the stipulations were Ultimate X. That was in the Team 3D corner, and if the baby faces get that, hey, Ultimate X is the pay-per-view. We've seen this before. It's usually exciting. They, they, they have in TNA history established what a Ultimate X match is. Then in the other corner is the, the plate. Tag champs? What? Who are the tag champs? That would be AJ Styles and Tyson Tomko. So what the fuck is this match for? To determine stipulations. No, what's the Ultimate X match for? Because they hate each other. It's going to be so they're going to get an X off a cable. Yeah. Wow. That's some hatred. <laughs> That's how much. I, I, I you know. Actually, you know what? I was speculating. It will probably be for possession of Black Machismo's belt. <laughs> that, so even though that could, we didn't, we didn't, they never even filled us in on that story. No, no they don't, we, don't, we don't know what's going to be hanging about the ring in this Ultimate X match. No, I actually now want to know who's got the belt and why don't they care anymore. <laughs> no. It wasn't mentioned a single fucking time on this show, was it? I don't think so. I, I think... What a failure of a program in every <laughs> conceivable way. I think in Johnny Devine's elf costume, the X belt was hidden in there somehow. Now, getting back to the other stipulation. Mike Tanay very casually mentioned... First he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, Team 3D doesn't want an ultimate next match because they're fat. <laughs> They're too fat to climb on cables. They will fall and hurt themselves. Therefore, they want the, alter- the alternative, which, as he noted, a plate glass table match, which they should be good at because they've had success in table matches before. And then he moved on. <laughs> Mike Tanay thought nothing of the fact that on the line was the potential to see a human body, a live human being, thrown through a plate of glass. Yeah. This was nothing to him. This is nothing to Don West. I was disturbed. I knew what was going to happen. And I was still disturbed by the possibility that the threat of a human being thrown through, through a plate of glass was supposed to tempt me to watch this match to see if that possibility may actually arise. You think too much. <laughs> and this was not the worst part of the show. No. In fact, the, the match here was why, fine. Why should we care about a guy going through a plate of glass? We saw glass on TV for free about an hour later. That is true. And tax. That is true. And a fucking Christmas tree made out of barbed wire. <laughs> well, we'll get to that. That's serious. So, the machine guns won. The machine we just got involved. The machine guns won. This was silly. This was stupid. But as the wrestling match, I've seen thousands worse. The midgets did get involved. I forgot to mention that. The best part was, so not only were the midgets involved at the end, and this was not a DQ, but uh, the guys were making legal tags in a fucking... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> In a pole match, a double north pole match. A little tag in and out like like good little boys here. God, this was stupid. So, Kurt showed up, and Amazing oh, yeah. Kong beat up the fat guys. Uh, there was a Nash showed up, and the hookers went after him, and then they got in a big brawl and were slipping and sliding on ice. Then Kurt showed up to tell Eric that there was no such thing as Santa because Eric was waiting for Santa to arrive. And this conversation was apparently important because we got about five minutes of it. It was five minutes of Kurt Angle and Eric Young discussing Spider-Man, Shrek, and Santa Claus. And Kurt and Karen finally went to get the booze. Oh, my God, Kurt, Karen was hot, by the way. She was practically nude at this Christmas party. I almost said Kurt. That would have been bad. Well, you're homosexual, so it would have been acceptable I was supposed to tell anyone in that, that way. ODB versus Awesome Kong versus the Voodoo Chick versus Jackie versus Christy Hemi versus Tracy versus Velvet Sky versus Angelina Love versus Gail Kim in a knockout street fight. A Santa's Workshop street fight match. Now, you're a trooper. You actually wrote down their names. I just wrote down all the girls. <laughs> Mayhem ensued. There was a toy box in the ring with presents in it, like swords and teddy bears. The fans inexplicably... Chanted, this is awesome. Hey, don't. Thus, if ever there has been a moment where that chant has jumped the shark, this was it. This it. Yes. Name it, one awesome thing about this match, aside from the porn star's entrance. There was. There was something awesome. But here's the key. Gail was the last one in. She hit the ring. She started brawling with Awesome Kong. They had a wicked fight. It was great. They brawled to the back and disappeared. After they left, that's when the fans chanted, this is awesome. Yes. This was not awesome, folks. No. This was dumb. Kong finally lurched back, killed everybody. By the way, I thought it was a battle royal. No. So when it's Kong, a street fight. When Kong came back, I was just very confused. It's just street fight. Then she picked up Christy, power bombed her for the pin. It was an utter, utter mess. Gail hit the ring, waffled Kong, including a chair shot to the head, and then there was a huge brawl, and security broke it up. Epic fail. 
Yeah. To the back. To the fucking back. Christmas party. Chris Harris showed up. He was all happy. Then he saw there was no music and no women. Eric was like, well, there were women here, but they got in a fight. And so Chris Harris said, well, it's Christmas and my birthday, so where's my present? And Eric Young was offended and said, well, somebody else has a birthday on Christmas. And I thought, so let me get this straight. You got a Christmas party here. You got no women. You got no music. And you don't even have presents here because it offends you that presents should be given on Jesus Christ's birthday. Couldn't say Jesus Christ on the show, apparently. So he said, J.C., at which point Matt Morgan goes, it's Jim Cornette's birthday on Christmas. I'm sorry, uh... Chris Harris. Oh, who cares? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so uh, then Chris Harris goes, who'd he ever beat? And all I can tell you is this was so much worse on television than it was reading it here. The midgets arrived, and also the midgets from the X Division match. So Cal Val had mistletoe, and Sanjay stole a kiss. To the back! Oh, that was it, folks. To the front! <laughs> to the windows. Uh, but yes, that, 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 was the, that was the payoff to all this, was Val brought the mistletoe, like Machizo came up to kiss her, and that perv, Sanjay Dutt, ran in, ran in, stole the kiss, and Sal, Sokal Val was offended and, and, and didn't bother kissing Machismo. I guess she had one kiss in her, and that was it for the year. Sucks to be Machismo. <clears throat> let's, re- let's return to the script here. All right. Where were we? I think we had a next page appears to be about 800 entrances. All right. Crystal and Kurt Angle. It's time for you to play the girl. This is after one of the gauntlet matches. Yeah. All right. Kurt Angle. We're only three days away from final resolution in your teenage title match against Christian Cage. Due to the indecision of AJ Style and Tomko. Yes, dash. AJ Style. I, I like that he just dash. Just pause here for no reason whatsoever. It appears that this match can go either way. Okay. I want you to read that again because you read it and I have no idea what you even said. You want to try to do the pathetic, awful girl voice again? No, just do what you did, but I'm just trying to figure out what they're even talking about here. I, I have see. no idea. I see. All right, here we go. Kurt Angle, we're only three days away from final resolution in your TNA title match against Christian Cage. Due to the indecision of AJ Styles and Tomko, it appears that this match can go either way. Either way? Are you kidding me? First of all, I know what the decision of AJ and Tomka will be. When you have the opportunity to be in the, the camp of an Olympic gold medal, you don't pass that up. I have everything those guys want, both professionally and personally. <clears throat> Let me look at Karen here. But you know what? Like everyone else, I'm sick of all the drama. So even though AJ is not here tonight, I'm demanding that Tomko meet me in that ring tonight and make his alliance with me official. Now, as far as Christian Cage goes, Cage, you might not even make it to final resolution because tonight... I have a plan for you. Never underestimate the brains of Kurt Angle. As they say, in a drawer full of knives, I may not be the sharpest. Kurt walks off. Crystal and Karen look at each other confused. Did he just say what I thought he said? Yes. Karen walks off. That's supposed to make it funny. No. It wasn't funny till they added that part right there to tell you that you're supposed to laugh. <laughs> right. And, by the way... This is your pay-per-view main eventer. Yeah. Being dumb. Yes. And, by the way, this is your pay-per-view main eventer who is sick of the angle. Okay, let's move forward to the pre God. with Crystal and Tomko. All right. What the hell is this? It's way up there. We're just rushing through this script here tonight. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Segment yeah. five. Got it. Okay. All right. Tomko, I guess according to Kurt Angle, tonight we will learn of your alliance at Final Resolution. Kurt or Christian? Who said that? Well, Kurt said a few moments ago that he was going to demand an answer from you tonight. Demand? Nobody demands anything from me. I'm sick and tired with a lack of respect. <laughs> I made that mistake allowing Christian to get away with it, and I'm not going to make that mistake again. I'm not AJ. Nobody disrespects me. You know what? I'm going to make this real easy for Kurt. I'm going to call him out to that ring right now, and demand his respect. I'm tired of this whole thing, Crystal. <laughs> it stops tonight. <laughs> Listen to this. Okay. All right. Let's move on with the real impact review, and then when we get back, everybody, there's a big segment with Tomko and Kurt Angle. I know you're all excited for that one. Who wouldn't be? <laughs> all right. Where were we? 
Crystal interviewed Joe, who was mad. He was being pissy. She wanted him to go to the Christmas party, and he said instead of spending all that money on a Christmas party, they could spend it on his contract or the TV time on his matches. He told her to tell Matt Morgan he was going to appear at the party and make sure it was one he never forgot. And he was yelling and screaming and staring down Crystal and just a dick. And he's supposed to be baby. Yes, he's supposed to be the hero. According to the script, he's a hero. Why? I know I, I shouldn't even say that word because you peaked with the why, <laughs> but like, why? Because they're fools. I think they're retarded. Well, yeah. Okay, so then we had best segment in history. <laughs> Which was the worst segment in history. Get this match. Relk, Abyss, Black Rain, and the Shark Boy in a neck brace. What? <laughs> <laughs> it was like they had three guys. They said, no, we need a fourth. Who is closest to where I am standing right this second? You in the fish head. Come here. <laughs> so, yes, Shark Boy in the, okay, the match begins. Well, let's first off, what do we have in the ring? All right, there were four dudes standing around us in a circle. In the center of the circle, in the center of the ring, was a Christmas tree composed entirely of barbed wire and some chains in there and stuff. And uh, the Christmas tree... It wasn't just standing like in a tree stand. It was suspended from the ceiling. Yes. It was hanging from a rope, just just barely touching the mat. And surrounded this barbed wire Christmas tree were packages, gifts. Sure. It was the holiday season after all. Now, <laughs> Brian skipped with the entrance, so it was not until the very end I, I knew what this was. I thought this was just a... Barbed wire Christmas tree mesh. No. 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 So the gifts are open. The gifts are open. And between the barbed wire Christmas tree and the gifts, this was the Silent Night Bloody Night match. Yes. Now, the highlight of this match, there were a couple of highlights, both involving the tree, actually. Actually, but even, be- but even before you get there. I don't know. The first one doesn't fall. Go do the first one. With the tree? With Shark Boy? <laughs> Which one are you talking about? The... Bathing the heels, which was, as we, we must explain, <laughs> Rick and Black Rain. They took poor Shark Boy, the X Division guy, the comedy geek, the dude in the neck brace. They took him to the corner, and they double teamed him, these two gym men, and they whipped him into the barbed wire Christmas tree. <laughs> he fell down. This was such a violent, cruel, vicious attack that Shark Boy took a bump, <laughs> and the Christmas tree went flying through the air. Swinging back and forth. He bounced. He bounced off the barbed wire Christmas tree. Yes. Now, Brian, there's two of us in this room. <laughs> One of us has actually had a barter incident in his life. Didn't you once write a... Uh, I did, actually. You, you wrote a, as a young boy, you once wrote a barbed... Uh, I'll wrote a tell bicycle. this story. Tell the story. I was on a hill. On a bike. On a, well, no, I was just on the hill. And my friend had a 10-speed. And he was like, you want to try riding my 10-speed? I was like, Sure. I had, like, a Huffy, one of those little bikes, you know what I mean? Absolutely. A little dirt bike. So I had never been on a 10-speed before or a fancy-ass bike like this. So I thought that when you get on a 10-speed and you start riding, you put on the brakes the same way you put the brakes on on a Huffy. You push you backwards, backwards on the pedal. Sure. That stops it. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, you were to learn. Oh, no, I was incorrect. The brake on a 10-speed is on the handle. I did not know that. I gained speed as I went down this hill, as we learned in physics class. E equals MC squared. I sped up and sped up and sped up. And at the bottom of the hill was a barbed wire fence. There was nothing I could do to stop. I was pedaling frantically in reverse to no avail. I thought that my friend had just chipped the chain off and attempted to kill me. And I fucking ran into the barbed wire fence with great fury. And I'll never forget that. Actually. Now, did you bounce? Oh, no. Did the barbed wire go flying? No. Did it puncture you? I thought that I may have been cut in about six pieces, actually, <laughs> and put back together in the hospital. I mean, we can laugh about this because you survived. I did survive. It sounds like it sucked. It did suck. Shark Boy was okay, though. <laughs> he was. Shark Boy bounced off the tree. This was where I started to giggle. <laughs> it got better with Relic. It got better, yes. I, I didn't giggle, by the way. The, the mess opened. Abyss and Black Rain started to brawl around ringside. Shark Boy and Relic stared at each other for a while and then began to slowly unwrap presents. <laughs> like a child on Christmas morn trying to build anticipation. So that didn't make me giggle. But when Shark Boy bounced off the barbed wire Christmas tree, <laughs> that was comedy. Okay, so the match continued. 
they were uh, trying to pin Shark Boy after he bounced off the tree. Are we getting to the relic part where he gets thrown into the tree? No, that's that's that is coming up here. Soon. Relic got whipped towards the tree, <laughs> and he just stopped running. <laughs> I, I'm not sure where that was. There was so much stupidity here, I couldn't write it all he down. He just stopped running. He's put on the brakes, to said. Yeah. He's like, shit, a barbed wire tree. I'll just stop <laughs> running. I'll stop running. I'm no not one's sure. ever thought of that in history of wrestling before. <laughs> I'm not sure if where that fit into the timeline here. There was a lot going on. So, Relic and, 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 and Black Rain, they had a... Shark Boy of the Mercy, one of them went for a pin, and the other pulled him off. <laughs> because every partner in every Magic TNA must fight. Here's the question. Here's the question, okay? There were two men teaming up to beat on one man. They were working together to be victorious. However, the one man could not allow his partner to get the pin here in a match with nothing on the line. Right. So he, he did not accept defeat here in the silent night, bloody night except match. Except defeat. Except he was his partner. Was it a tag team match? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> no. Now that I think about it, I have no earthly idea. <laughs> Does this mean Abyss and Shark Boy were a tag team? It may have been a four-way. We don't know. And apparently this win was very important to Black Ring. <laughs> sure, either way. He did a W on his win-loss record. Okay, so... <laughs> Wait, there is more. There is more. So Abyss walks over to the packages. He uh, selects one random, I guess. Or maybe Did we get the one where the, the Christmas tree got thrown that's in? Coming. That, that, that's coming. That's coming. That's coming. There is more. So Abyss walks over to the packages. He picks one at random, or perhaps there was a tag that said, To Abyss from Santa. <laughs> to, Chris. to Chris. To Chris. To Chris from Santa. <laughs> so he unwraps it, and he takes it out. It's a baseball bat. Wrapped with barbed wire. He says, cool, and he turns around to use it. Now, the problem with this is, from underneath, he pulled this package out from underneath a tree composed entirely <laughs> of barbed wire. If you're going to hit someone, you would not hit them with a the bat. You would hit them with the tree, I would think. You would think. I would think this has many more sharp points. Now, granted, perhaps he watched Shark Boy bounce off it and think, hey, that wouldn't hurt at all. <laughs> perhaps he's capable of that higher thought. But I'm just saying, if you told me I could hit someone with a bat with barbed wire on it, or a tree that was, in fact, barbed wire, I'd go with the tree. So, seconds later, he got taxed. <laughs> he was not satisfied with the tree or the bat. He got taxed. And that, Brian, that right there is where I wrote down, this is the lowest point in impact history. <laughs> And then glass. And then there was so much more. And when the more happened, that's where I lost all control. This is where I began to laugh uncontrollably. I was so, so overwhelmed with bullshit after bullshit after wave of fucking bullshit, and I could take no more, and I could just and revel in it. This made me jolly. So, yes, Abyss got tax. Abyss got glass. Let's see. Did anyone end up going... A tree! Okay, then, yes. So then there was the greatest spot I've ever seen all the time, all my life. Okay, so the tree's hanging, right? The tree's hanging in the ring. So Abyss and Shark Boy, who are now working together, they take Black Rain and wave him from one corner to the other. The tree is in the ring, though. This forces Black Rain to run in a circle. He must circum he must circumnavigate the tree. He must run in a loop over the other corner. <laughs> they, take, they, take, they take Relic. They wave him in. And uh, apparently he was just following his buddy Black Rain's footsteps because he also went around the tree. Then he went into the corner. All right, so now, let me, let me reset the stage so I'm sure you're all having trouble visualizing this. So Black Rain is in the corner. Relic is in front of him also in the corner. The tree is hanging, <laughs> the tree. hanging in the center of the ring. <laughs> and Abyss and Shark Boy are, are, are on the other side. They then grab the tree, which is hanging. That's important. They pull it back to the opposite corner as far as it will go. So now it's hanging off the mat, and it's got some tension in it, like a, you know, like a pendulum. They then release it, and it slowly swoops forward <laughs> and arcs down. A lot, there's a lot of air in this Christmas tree. <laughs> there's a lot of air. It, it kind of lightly bumps off the mat. It keeps swinging. Relic, <laughs> Relic has time to avoid, and he runs for his life from the Tree of Doom. Now, you will recall that when Shark Boy was thrown into this tree, he bounced. <laughs> now, 
Black Rain did not bounce. Or what should I say? The tree did not bounce off Black Rain. Why? <laughs> because he opened his arms wide. And he gave the tree a great bear hug. He, he clutched the tree close to his chest and nuzzled it to ensure that it stuck him. I can't believe there's a tree made of barbed wire in this match. <laughs> and they had to fake poke it. <laughs> so, okay, so this year, so here's the <laughs> So here's Black Rain. He's in the corner, stuck with a tree. He's holding on to the tree to mimic being stuck with it. Out comes Jim Mitchell. He did. Jim Mitchell came out. He was wearing a purple suit like the Joker. <laughs> this did not help my composure. <laughs> and he is looking at this. He's looking at this match with his rest in the streets. What is going on here? Like he was confounded by this, by these events. Okay. From here, I'm fuzzy. I admit. The lights go out. Mitchell got on the apron. I, I think there was a pin here that Mitchell distracted the ref from. Mitchell gets in the apron. The lights go out, and there was Judas Macias. Okay. Yeah, I, I, all I know, there, there's a few minutes of action here. I, was I will tell hard. you what happened. Here's something what happened. The lights went out. Judas Macias appeared in the ring. He dropped a miss into the thumbtacks. No one cared, like we've never seen that one before. And then in the background, you see Relic pin Shark Boy with a jackhammer. He won! <laughs> he pin Shark Boy with a jackhammer. Yes. I was aware in that he won. In the middle of the mat. <laughs> there was no tree involved. There was no barbed wire ma- uh, bat involved. There was no uh, tax or glass involved. He gave him a suplex and pinned him. <laughs> he pinned him with a wrestling hold. Oh, God. Yes, and this, by the way, they killed Relic's gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing of TNA I always enjoyed, no, he won a match. <laughs> he won a match. This was so horrible. <laughs> this is worse than anything in the history of Nitro. <laughs> this is worse than anything in the history of Thunder. This sucked. <laughs> This was a bad one. Oh, God. And then finally we got the main event. A ladder match. AJ Styles against Kaz. <laughs> you, you skipped two Christmas party segments. Joe arrived. Oh, that's right. The hero, the babyface, the champion of the people. He threw a tantrum and wrecked the Christmas party. He did. What an asshole. Oh, God. So then they came back from break. It was down to just Eric Young and Borash and... Eric was still having faith that Santa Claus would arrive, and Santa showed up. A big, big, we just saw a big, thick pair of red legs and black boots, and we saw Eric look up and say, Santa! Then it ended. Then we got our main event. There was a ladder match. It was the best match on the show. That's saying absolutely nothing. There was absurdly stupid shit. A super a suplex from the inside to the outside, dropping AJ on a ladder that was leading up as a barricade. A DDT that Don identified as a power move. <laughs> An ass first backdrop onto a ladder, a hip toss off the ladder. Finally, Angle came out to watch and offer advice to AJ Styles. What was his advice, Vince? Pull it down. He Pull said. it down. That was his advice. AJ was distracted. Cast tipped the ladder over, got the reindeer costume. He was so happy to have won that he disappeared. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Two things. One, AJ was in position to win. He was atop the ladder, had his hand on the reindeer head. And then he was distracted by Kurt Angle and couldn't focus. So, first of all, there was a screw job finish in the grab the reindeer ladder match. This match cannot have a clean finish. Second of all, as noted, Kaz. Oh. <laughs> they need to add some of the impact skits. <laughs> all of them. Yes, go on. Okay, Kaz, yes, he, he, he was so entertained by the possibility of AJ Styles wearing a reindeer costume, he left. Yeah. He didn't give a shit. No. He had better things to do watch this crappy show. She went away. So, yeah, then they uh, spent an hour trying to get him to put on this reindeer costume. He finally put it on. Angle was out there, told him he was a turkey for Thanksgiving and a reindeer for Christmas. He was disappointed in him. He called him a disgrace. AJ, he told him to uh, <clears throat> head back to the hotel and say, I'm not a reindeer a thousand times. But before he finally got the they costume, they did a huh? skit where AJ was in the uh, in the reindeer costume in a hotel room, saying, "I am not a reindeer." No, but you have to say, "I'm not a reindeer a thousand times." I'm not a reindeer a thousand times. And then walk out. That's comedy. Yes. 
<laughs> uh, then, they would, then they would need curtains there to say, I can't believe he thought of that. Yes. To, to indicate that it was a joke. Yes. Yes. That, uh, we were, we, Jesus, dude, we're starting to write like TNA. We are. That's horrifying. So I also like that before AJ got his costume on, he was through one final tantrum. He took the reindeer head. He shoved it into Earl Hebner's chest. And Earl Hebner had to be held back. <laughs> Referees had to protect AJ Styles from getting his ass beat by Earl Hebner. Well, you know, he fucking screwed Brett. So Santa came out, and he had to talk with Kurt, and Kurt said Santa never brought him a present. Santa said, well, you were a naughty boy. And Angle said, well, you know what I want for Christmas is for Christian to grow some balls and uh, show up tonight and let me finish what I started last week. And he proceeded to clothesline Santa, tossed Eric outside, put the jolly old elf in an ankle lock, Santa apparently is a UFC fan because he tapped. Can't possibly be a TNA fan. And then uh, Christian ran out of a gift box at ringside, beat up Kurt. And this show ended with Mike Tanay saying, and I quote, Merry Christmas, everybody from TNA. Especially Dave Meltzer, who flipped out tonight, everybody. <laughs> he had a meltdown. He lost his mind watching Impact, I believe. And on the Observer site, there was a headline in all capital letters that merely read, that show was wretched. He could take no more. He had to vent. If ever there was a day that we needed Dave on the show, it would be tonight. This was the equivalent of Dave Meltzer going going to the window, throwing it wide, <laughs> screaming, I'm mad as hell and I can't take it anymore. This show broke me. Dave Meltzer has watched pro wrestling, I think, every day of his life since about age 10. This was a show that pushed him over the edge. I don't think I've ever seen him do anything like this. No. So, that, that's why I said this, that's why it was funny. Because when you showed me that, I, I, I didn't laugh as hard as I did at the Silent Night Bloody Night match, but I laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> if you did that, it wouldn't be funny. No. Because it's, it's not I do it every you. day. Yes. <laughs> Dave Meltzer, the, 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 the guy who puts up headlines such as ECW rating was, and that's his principle. <laughs> Dave Meltzer had an emotional reaction, yeah. an outburst. He did. He, he was irrational. He's finally come over to my side. And you have finally come over to my side. <laughs> I've been right all along. This show sucks. This show is an awful television program. It is completely useless. It was good for a laugh tonight. I did, I did laugh, and laughter is the best medicine. I, I, I have one more thing to say. More. We, we, we have noted, we, we, thankfully we have the script here to inform us that Samoa Joe is a baby face, because otherwise I would be certain he was a heel. So they're going into this pay-per-view match here with uh, Kurt Angle versus Christian Cage, the main eventing, and well, Kurt Angle seems to be the heel. I, I guess maybe just for this one show, Christian will do the babyface turn. He seemed to be the babyface here. He got the better of Kurt by the end. He outsmarted him. Even but if he didn't have the script. I looked at the script. He's still a heel. <laughs> he can still identify it as a heel. The go-home show he it is a double heel main event. Really? You know, you know what Joe is? I got a problem with Joe calling himself Small Joe. You're a freaking half breed. I'm gonna treat you like a half breed. That's right. You play the Cher, Artie Reynolds half breed song. What if, uh, what if it would have said on the script, Joe, and in parentheses, half breed? <laughs> Think they could have got away with that one? I would have. You know what? It would be believable. Yeah, I don't believe it's a baby face. <laughs> Well, let's read a little more of the script, and we'll wrap it up. We ain't going to finish this whole thing. There's just too much. Oh, that's the other thing, by the way. This two-hour script is about 48 pages long. It really is, yes. Okay, so we're doing that. Uh... Uh, this is Kurt and uh, Tomko. Who do you want to be? I'll be Kurt. All right, go for it. That's right, Tomko. I'm demanding an answer from you. I'm tired of the games you and AJ are playing. I'm three days away from a title match with Christian at a final resolution, and I have to worry about my own soldiers. What kind of an army is this? Capital A, Anchor. What kind of a rated R army is this? I want an answer. Long pause. And I want one now, Tomko. Long pause. Whose side are you on? You know what, Kurt? You're right. The time has come for me to declare which side I'm on, even though I made up my mind weeks ago. When you talk about an army, it means strength. Capital A army. It means unity. It means family. It means you'll take a bullet for the guy in the foxhole next to you. That's what an army means to me. So the simple question is, who would I take a bullet for, you or Christian? Well, after a little debate, the answer was simple. In that foxhole, the only person I take that bullet for is myself. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. If you and Christian were to go down in a blaze of glory, that would be too fine with me. 
That is exactly what it says. What are you saying, Tomko? I'm saying that I'm officially declaring taking the side of neither the Angle Alliance or the Christian Coalition. It is time for Tomko to be Tomko. It is time for me to be on my own. Kurt bows his head and looks up. You know what? I may not agree with it, but I respect it. And then it breaks out into a fight. Oh, no, there's a punch and some other such bullshit. And then uh, it's less with crap. Kurt Angle, the TNA World Champion, being emasculated. <laughs> Shocker right there. I can't read any more of this. <laughs> I thought of reading this one, but then I saw the names Crystal, Black Machismo, Guru, Black Machismo, and Tage. Too much. What a horrible, horrible show. Before we let you go, Mike, again, did you watch TNA? <laughs> no shit, I actually did. You've got to be kidding me. Oh. Yeah, for, the first, for the first time in literally a year, I've watched the past two episodes of TNA. Except for I missed the first half hour of this episode because he gives a shit. But. Well, can you hold on a little while? We'll have you review this one with us. Yeah, sure. You got nothing well, to tell do. you what you missed. It's only uh, 109. Uh, yeah, I don't care. I'm not going to sleep for a while. This show was just lame. They all are. I, I can no. I, I will say I can no longer get excited and, and angry and, and 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 vengeful about these these shows. I can only get tired. These shows just drain me now. And I got a funny letter from somebody today that was mad at me about TNA. And uh, it's funny that the people that get mad at me about TNA, when they explain why I'm wrong, what they do is they explain why they don't like WWE and they like TNA. And it's like, great. Out of 1.5 million people, there is 1% that like TNA. You happen to be one of them. What the fuck does that mean? Really? Nothing. Yes. It means I'm happy for you that you enjoy the show, but guess what? Nobody else does, and that's not my fault. If so, I watched and reviewed, for example, Desperate Housewives, I probably would hate it. There's still millions of people that like it. Sure, yeah. exactly. And that's that's the story of, of Impact. It's a bunch of people... Uh, you know, that watch a, a shitty show and enjoy it. And uh, more power to those people. So, this opened up with the the uh, claim that the Christian Coalition had been one of the most dominant groups in TNA history. Right. Already wacky. Yeah, so they asked, why? What have they done? No answer. Crystal interviewed AJ about who he was going to join up with, Christian or Angle. AJ said Karen told him he could bat for both teams. That was what he was going to do. Tomko said, no, you're a dumbass. Karen had lied. We need to make a decision, the two of us. AJ wanted to know what he was going to do. Tomko said, I've made a decision, but it's a secret. And then AJ told him they were in this together. And uh, my question throughout every segment of the show is, if you care, raise your hand. Not much of a question, but it's a fine statement. No one could possibly care about who, it, which, side, which side AJ Styles is on. It's not even like Kurt's a heel and Christian's a baby face and the crowd wants AJ to join them. No, he's choosing between two heels. Mike, make sure you tell us when you started watching so we can get your well, thoughts. Well, well I, actually, I was going to ask you guys, because like I said, I haven't watched TNA in forever, and I was actually really confused because, first of all, I, I, know, AJ Styles, I know AJ Styles is pretty much like a complete geek, and I know Kurt Angle's a heel, and I was pretty sure Christian's a heel, and I really wasn't sure why I was supposed to care that AJ went with one or the other. Like, I didn't know if Kurt and Christian were having a match at the pay-per-view. They are having a match at the pay-per-view. What would it matter who's, who is AJ going to be like the okay. two on one? Hey, hey, this is the way, th uh, th this is how the pay per view is being marketed. Kurt so Angle. Gonna, go, uh, so he, go ahead. So basically, they're selling the pay per view on the idea that your AJ Styles is going to choose the guy for whom he's going to interfere with. Yes, on yes. The pay -per -view. They, are pro they are promising a run in, but you don't know who the run in is going to benefit. <laughs> but Bye. TNA, so, is this TNA so I know when it's. For like almost the fact that whoever he chooses, he's going to turn on that guy at the paper. <laughs> That's actually I, very likely. I would imagine that he turns him in the next uh, three minutes or so after he makes his decision. But yes, that, that is the main angle of TNA: is who or will who will AJ Styles interfere for? Yes. Okay, I, I was just making sure I was following. I I, I kind of had I sat forward through some of the backstage stuff. But, I should add that this is only our interpretation of it. <laughs> I don't think there's a right answer, and if there is, we may not have it. So, so that, this is kind of like reading Hemingway or something, where there's multiple but, interpretations no, of what that, that's, that's, that's bad. Bad example. That's a very bad example. It, it's like reading. It's like reading Hemingway in French, if you don't speak French, or I, Spanish, where you 
Because uh, in no, Spanish, because there's still quality in there, even if you can't understand it. I, I, in Spanish, I will catch every tenth word or so, and, and I'll be trying to make sense out of that. No, this is just shit. Can't compare it to Hemingway. Senshi and Messias was a largely a squash, except Senshi, who is quitting, actually had a competitive match with the new monster. Right. Why? Because they're morons. Because they're fucking morons. Yes. So, um, Messias won, and then that was that. We did a backstage skit with Angle, Borash, and Karen. It was all bad comedy. That was the story of the show. They did a tease, which I can't believe I'm using that word, but I don't have any other words that I could even... I don't even know how to explain this. They were pretending that Borash was getting Angle a hand job, and apparently this was supposed to be arousing? Or funny. Funny? I don't know. <laughs> it was none of the above. It was just dumb. It was... Again, the whole point of this is, here's our world champion. Laugh at him. Ha, ha, ha. So then Karen came in and was bitching about some new girl who had come to TNA and distracted everybody. I had no fucking idea what she was talking about. Brian and I were looking at each other and saying, who the fuck is she talking about? I actually thought that she was talking about the new interview girl. Because there had been an interview a while back where somebody yelled at the interview girl for liking somebody. And I was like, why? Who? What? What are you talking about? (laughs) And then Kurt turns to Karen and says, what are you talking about? So Kurt also has no idea what's going on on the show. And it turned out she was talking about Charmel. And they babbled about bullshit, and I wrote, this is the worst program on earth. I swear to God, (laughs) my last, look at my notes, worst show ever is what I wrote here. Yes. Yes, thumbs down. Thumbs down. And I don't know what was going on. So then uh, Christian came out to rant about the AJ storyline. He uh, said some shit, and then uh, I was trying to figure out if he was babyface or heel. Thank God we had the script for next week. Said he wanted a decision from Tomko and AJ right now. AJ came out alone, no Tomko. Uh, they bebop back and forth. AJ called him boss, and Christian said, a boss is someone you would take a bullet for. <laughs> now I like my boss. Fine guy, funny guy, and I, I like working out with him, liking working with him, he's a fine boss. If a guy comes in with a gun, I'm going under my desk. <laughs> yes. I can just let it be known. So then, uh, Christian was, was, no, then Angle came out, and they had a tug of war with AJ. They each grabbed an arm and pulled. Yes. And then they had a fight with Angle and Christian, and Christian accidentally hit AJ with the belt. And then Christian bailed and said he wanted AJ and Tonko's decision by the end of the night. Once again, if you care, say I. Wait, did I'm... Christian have a belt? <laughs> <laughs> Christian apparently grabbed... He, he grabbed Kurt's belt. But, but oh. the, the key point of this here is that besides the fact that Christian took credit for the, everything AJ had ever done, including the things he had done in TNA before they met, this came down to Christian grabbing one of AJ's arms, Kurt grabbing the other. They had a tug of war with AJ, and then AJ fought back and pulled them together, and they bonked. Yes. Yes. The champion and his challenger of the pay-per-view had a pratfall. <laughs> this shows such garbage. It does. Crystal interviewed Robert Roode, who said, Finally, I'm a main eventer. Remember that, everyone. I saw that, I saw that part, and I was really confused, because I did not really know who Robert Roode was. I was pretty sure he wasn't a main eventer. Well, well, as it turns out, the comedy is he said, finally I'm a main eventer. They go to a commercial, and they come back, and he's coming to the ring for his match. 28 minutes into the show. A two-hour show. This is like this is like the old deal where, uh, who was it that had the contract that said they had to be the a main demon. eventer? It was the demon. Yes. So, like, he'd be on third on the card, and WCW would say, in tonight's co-main event, and out would come the demon. So, anyway, he came out for his match with, I guess, uh, Booker T., and then Karen ran down and beat up Charmel, and then uh, there was some stuff that happened, and uh, then I guess they oh uh, somebody came out somebody help me here what happened okay so so Karen came out to to brawl Charmel, Booker went out to break that up Kurt went out to break that up this led to Kurt and Rude dragging Booker T into the ring and I'm quoting Don West here stomping him with their feet. <laughs> So they, they proceeded to stomp him with their feet. He eventually fought, off, fought them off and, and, and bailed, and he challenged them to a match later with the two of them against himself and a partner of his choosing. That was the, the result of all this. Sucked. So we had uh, third AJ segment of the night within 35 minutes. More stupid comedy. AJ wanted to know what Borash was, would do if he were in his place, and Borash said go with the angles because Kurt's the champ and Karen is hot. You don't want to be on the B team, do you? And AJ said he wanted to be on both teams. And Bar said, that'll never work. And uh, Who much, cares? Much like the comedy on this show, never works. It never works. Yeah. 
Interview today. Sit down interview with Abyss later. This was the tease. It is. Oh, I, well, to be fair, we got excited. Yeah. When we heard that Mike Tanay were having a sit-down interview with Chris Abyss later in the show, we said, oh, boy, I can't wait. Because the preview showed Abyss sitting in a chair like he was on a talk show, and today's next to him, and today says, and I quote, tell us about the secret, Chris. <laughs> and then they cut the commercial. Like, that's, that's the hook. Right. That's the hook to get you to come back. Tell us about that secret, Chris. Mike Snay grilling Chris Abyss. AJ came out for the fourth segment in 40 minutes. Tonko was there as well. They actually had a match. It was, it was Motor City Machine Guns versus Tomko and AJ. I actually wrote the Machine Guns versus Shelly and Chris Saban, but may as well have been. They did all the work here. And uh, actually, AJ looked pretty good. So um, they had a little match, and Eric Young was there at ringside. We do not know why. No. Mike, I know you're probably asking the same question. We don't we know. We don't know. And we watch this show every week. <laughs> okay. He was just there. I didn't even know who it was at first. He was wearing a, like a black T-shirt and a black baseball cap. So I, all I see was there was a blonde man at ringside. And I thought, who the fuck is that? Is that Eric Young? What are they doing there? And, 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 and time passed. I, I have a question for everyone. Why do the Motor City Machine Guns work as hard as they do? <laughs> God that bless was- them. That, that, was, that was my exact thought, because I, I was watching this, because I heard about the Motor City, City Machine Guns. And I remember, Alex Shell is pretty good. Chris Saban's pretty good. And I watched the match, and it was pretty fun. Although, <laughs> again, the Eric Young thing really confused me, because I don't know what the hell he's doing there. No, but no then I remember does. somebody on the board started a thread where they said, why do Saban and Shelley try so hard? Yes. And that was all I could think of the entire <laughs> time. And it's, watching, well, and, and it's true, because they do try so hard, and, and, and they're... You can't even say it's a glass ceiling. It, it, it's a big concrete slab above them, and it's dropping. And that's what they're finding. I think they just all wrestle in glass. It's yeah. like no ceiling. It's just they're in a big slab of glass. Every or, single person. There's a big pit of shards of glass everywhere. Sure. Uh, that could Whoa, be wait, 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 wait. Wasn't that the week before when they had the glass all over the ring? That was, yeah. That was <laughs> with the barbed wire Christmas tree, which we will <laughs> get was, to, by the way. That was tremendous. Barbed wire Christmas tree. i got to give Vince Russo credit. I never in a million years would have thought that a barbed wire Christmas tree was that was a Fun idea for a wrestling show. <laughs> oh, yeah, my, yeah. Mom, my brother actually walked through and he goes, why the fuck is there a barbed wire Christmas tree? I go, I don't know. <laughs> why wouldn't you have a barbed wire that. Christmas tree in a wrestling show? Yes. So it turns out the reason Eric Young was there was because he knew AJ was having a moral dilemma and he wanted to give AJ advice. Really? I didn't even know that. Wait, wait, hold on a second. We didn't even go over the finish. The finish was both machine guns pinned... Somebody. They, they, roll, they did a double roll-up on AJ. With, on AJ. Oh, with, yeah. With two I, men holding him down. I was wondering if that was legal in TNA, if you could do double pins. I've actually, I, cool, actually, I have an explanation for this, Mike. My theory is that every individual in TNA has their own rules for their matches. Team 3D can use tables in every match, and it's not a DQ. Abyss can use thumbtacks and glass in every match, and it's not a DQ. Um, Black Rain can use his wacky stick and a mouse and a tree made of barbed wire. And apparently the Motor City Machine Guns can double up on one man and pin him at the same time, and it's legal. Yes. Well, what well, you missed, Brian, was right before that, AJ hits one of them for the Styles class, at which point Eric chose that point to climb up on the apron and distract AJ, saying, hey, I have some advice for you. Yes. And AJ paused, and he got double teamed and pinned. Uh, the, the wrestling itself was fine. The The... the, the Finish and, and Eric Young's involvement in it was infuriating. The only the other thing I have to note is that Don West at one point said the Motor City Machine Guns are popular with all the young people. <laughs> he himself has no use for them, I guess. He's old. So, why do we Oh, and, and then, because it wouldn't be TNA, AJ and Tomko had a fight. Of course. Every partner must fight. We had Crystal and Cornette's office with Team 3D, Morgan, and Havoc. They were refusing the Ultimate X match. Cornette said that they had to do it. And kicked him out of the office, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, it's TNA, so we had Matt Morgan fighting with his friend Jim Cornette. <laughs> it must be. Two friends must fight in every single segment. Yes. Watching Jim Cornette in TNA, I wish I had a, 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 a less crude <laughs> metaphor for this, but imagine, for example, if Mike, Mike's dog swallowed a diamond and he found it deposited in the yard the next day. That's what Jim Cornette is like in TNA. He's, he's a diamond shining in a pile of shit as the rest of the show. Wow. He, he had a line here about how uh, the... the, the Three D was you, know, you mentioned three D speeding with the X division. He said you've been hitting guys with tables, you've been hitting them with chairs. Worst of all, you've been jumping in the air and landing on them. <laughs> yes, he's Cause, awesome because he's fat. Then we had Team Prawn against uh, and Gail Kim against Jackie the Voodoo Chick and ODB. So ODB, who is very popular, is a heel, and the porn stars are apparently baby faces. Uh, 
Jackie beat the shit out of Angelina Love or Angelina Sky, whichever one she is. Gail Porn Star A. Gail pinned the voodoo chick, and uh, this was fucking bad. There was a point in here where ODB, who I, the crowd loves her, I personally do not know why, but they do. She took a drop toe hold and came up selling her breast. <laughs> she <laughs> touched her breast to, and just to say, ow, I've hurt my breast. What do you think of the women, Mike? I, out of the goodness, I'm not, I'm not kidding. Over the past two weeks, I've really enjoyed watching the women in TNA. Really? And it, 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 it's, it's weird, and this is going to be like the, the biggest stretch of an analogy of all time, but it reminds me kind of of watching like the cruiserweights in WCW in the 90s and that they're just so different than when everything else I'm seeing. That's true. And I feel like I, all the women surprisingly do have the distinct personalities, and yeah. whether it's you know, the whore, the porn stars, or amazing, awesome I guess being a voodoo fans, queen is a... I mean, they, I, I kind of know who they all are, and I kind of get behind it. And I don't know. I think it's kind of cool. I like the way that they, the Gail Kim Awesome Kong feud seems kind of okay. That's great. And, there I agree with you. Yes. That's great. Yeah, and I sit there, and I'm sitting there, an ODB, that chick's got more charisma. I've never seen, like, a woman wrestler with as much charisma as her before. I mean, she's got something, and she, people really like her. And I've never seen a people. creature like her before. I can't, <laughs> I can't compare her to other female pro wrestlers or male pro wrestlers or fighters or movie stars or anything. I don't know what she is, but people seem to like her. And she's I, mean, a heel. I think she's really getting over. I, I mean, and she's a heel. That'd be the best. I, yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't really realize she's supposed to be a heel, but <laughs> well, I, she kind of got old. And the porn stars. I mean, they're gimmick is that they're giant whores, but they're really convincing with it. So I mean, <laughs> I'll, I'll give the division two thumbs up for right now. I mean, they are in I fact hot. At least I know who all the players are, and I'm they've kind gotten, of interested in the feud over the belt. So. They've gotten the gimmick over. Yeah, you, you can you can in fact tell the women apart from each other. Actually, that's, I, that, I, that's fair. I was unfair with this match. I can't say it, it was fucking bad. It, the, the, the thing that, that annoyed me was was after Gale pinned the voodoo chick, I thought, remember like three weeks ago when ODB pinned Gale, <laughs> and it has led to absolutely nothing. <laughs> yes. What bullshit that is. Yeah, so the, the, the announcement, you, they came to mind because the announcer said, well, now that Gail has pinned Roxy Laveau, now she can focus on Awesome Kong. And you thought, what about ODB? Shouldn't she want her win back against ODB? They forgot. Yes, yeah, so there was also a point here where one of the porn stars did a dive from the top over the floor. That was scary. Terrifying. Yeah. Never again. Yeah. Please. That Great. woman, did, I don't know if she's like a trained worker, but I cannot imagine that she is because she just looked so... Unathletic jumping off there. Amazing way she has been that. trained. She, she, she's trained er <laughs> compared of the two. Cornette yelled at Matt Morgan backstage. This is the best segment I've ever seen. He said corporate was upset about the Christmas show. They put he put the heat on Matt Morgan. So then Morgan says he has a letter from corporate, which included a bonus check and a letter congratulating them on the Christmas show and the phenomenal ratings it drew. <laughs> I swear to God. Uh, so yes, at, at this point, Brian and I sat down and we watched masturbation. I will. The point I will, of the segment was, in fact, a show that the management of a show doing a segment for their own pleasure. The best part was they taped four weeks of television in like two weeks. <laughs> so this was taped a long, long time ago. Yeah. And it, it, this, this was this show was taped before the Christmas show aired. So that tells you that they actually thought that this Christmas show was a huge success and did big ratings. Oh, yeah. <laughs> after all, there was a barbed wire Christmas tree. Think about that for a little bit. Everyone just be quiet for a second and just think about that for a second. Think about that. They thought that that Christmas show was going to be a success. They thought it would be a critical and commercial triumph. <laughs> it would draw a bigger rating than the 1.1 it drew. <laughs> and the 1.1 it always draws, yes. What dumb shit? The, the other great part was, of course, the, the, of course, they had Jim Cornette there to represent, well, us and everyone else with a brain in the sport, and, and, and he was there to bury it. And, and they were there to say, no, Cornette and Brian and Vinny and Meltzer and Keller and everyone else out there, we're good. If you don't like it, there's something wrong with you. Yes. They were wrong. Well, what I didn't get is Jim Cornette said that management was upset, and he's acting like somebody had told him something was bad. Well, he... Then... he he had they were a letter not... saying it wasn't bad, and then he had some mystery signature that he'd never seen before. So apparently, they're already <laughs> seizing some super. I guess it was be Ventura, so higher power a, that yes. runs everything. And yes. I don't. He'd never seen that signature before, and I don't know who the hell they're appealing to because 
who gives a fuck? Who wants to know <laughs> whose signature is on Jim Cornette's paycheck? Yes. Or Morgan made it up. Or Morgan forced it, yes. <laughs> yeah, the, I guess. To, 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 to answer your first question, to be fair, the the blew by it. I caught it. Apparently, neither, neither you did. But Cornette said he had gotten he had gotten a phone call from management. He had not taken it. He assumed it was bad news. Oh. Oh. So that's there is. See, that's just shittiness. The fact the, that the only good part of that whole segment was when Cornette said he'd keep the check. <laughs> I said that was pretty funny. So then it was time for the sit-down interview with Mike Tanay and Chris Abyss. Actually, there was more to that segment after oh, all the Yes. Samoa, Samoa Joe came in to bitch and whine more because he's, you know, a baby face. Oh, I was going to ask if he's a heel or a face because he seemed like the whiniest bitch I've ever he seen. He is a, a, a whiny, scowly bitch, and he, he's a baby face. You're supposed to cheer for him. So he announced that he was not going to wrestle tonight because he's a pussy, and Cornette said, yes, you are. And if you don't like it, you can leave. And Joe said, fine, it's my decision, and Joe left. And so they, they announced, up, coming up next, will Joe show up? And then that, he showed up. Again, that is to get you to stick around for the commercial break to see if Joe will wrestle his match. So we had the big interview with Mike Tanay and Chris Abyss. First, Tanay wanted Abyss to confirm that Chris was his real name. Abyss said, Abyss is Chris Parks. So then... Tanae said, exactly how long have you known Father James Mitchell? And Abyss said, too long. So Tanae wanted to know if it was true that Chris's father had raised him. And Chris said, no, my mom raised me. And then Tanae got confrontational and wanted to know the secret. And Chris said the secret lived with him and it would die with him. And Tanae said, no, this is your opportunity to tell the world. And Abyss said he would never tell. Tanae would not give up. He said, one last chance, Chris. And then Abyss finally stormed off. And once again, if you care, say I. Uh, when I. When I watched this, Silence. my first thought was that somebody was trying to cre- recreate the Jim Ross Mankind deal, and they totally didn't understand why that segment worked. Indeed. <laughs> this, because this most this, certainly did not work. Yes. This was so, it was so well-lit. Like, it was the most well-lit studio I'd ever seen. <laughs> There's a bitch just sitting there, like, in these obviously forced, monosyllabic responses, yes. and it was, it was so bad, and it was so forced, and yes. it, it just, I'm watching this going, what the fuck, who gives a flying shit at all, <laughs> this is so pointless, I don't know, I don't know why I care if his name is Chris or not, because I'm sorry, but Chris and Abyss sound way too alike, and I know this may be a minor point, but their names are too similar that they're even differential, like, I hear Chris and Abyss, I hear the same name. I don't give a shit. If his name was John, maybe it'd be a big deal. I don't know. But this is just a total waste of time. And it was just, it was so heavily scripted. And I didn't know what the hell was going on. And nobody told me why I should care. And I'd heard them call Abyss Chris before. So I didn't know what that was a big deal. And who gives a shit if his mom or his dad raised him? <laughs> I don't know. Who, I don't know. Who could possibly give a shit about any of this? You compare this to, to Jim Ross and, and Mick Foley. And the difference there was, that was pretty much Jim Ross interviewing Mick Foley, and Mick Foley just channeled the negative memories he had of his own childhood. What we saw on Thursday was Mike Tanay, when they, they told him, be stern. And at best they said, be scary. And then they just filmed what happened. I was so not interested in the interview at all and so fascinated with their surroundings and their environment. Here's Mike Tanay in Abyss in his gear and his mask. They're sitting in these big comfy chairs. In the background, the, the, like the television with the Impact logo. Between them, they took the time, someone brought it an end table, and set up bric-a-brac all about it. <laughs> and then every time they cut to Abyss for a close-up shot, behind him there was this, this big ornate pot, pottery, was decorating the, the Mike Tanay lounge. This is like the shittiest talk show of all time. This, this was at the same time a giant thumbs up and thumbs down. I was just thinking, why would Abyss agree to do this? <laughs> yeah, and then not answer anything. <laughs> so stupid. I wonder how he got there. Do like a bit drive like a rented car? He's like driving a Prius. Sure, he's got a license that has Chris Park written on it. <laughs> then we had Joe and he looked skipper in a squash, and then uh, he kept beating on him till the ref called for a DQ, a disqualification. Everybody, a <laughs> rule in TNA. There are rules. So Joe's so Joe's rules that he can be DQ'd. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> he, he drew the short end of the rules. He's taking the rule lottery. He pick. did. Yes. And, he's, he's a face, right? Yes, yeah, he's he, a face. He came out. He after. The last time when he came in and he whined and complained and bitched, he came out here and he bullied a guy and he pulled him up a two and he shoved down a referee and he bitched more and then he cut off his mic and he whined about him more. He is, in fact, a baby face. You were supposed okay. to cheer him. Think about the fact that Samoa Joe is a baby face and his gimmick was that he didn't want to wrestle because he's a whiner. 
and compare that to George St. Pierre, who beats one of the greatest fighters on the planet, and then afterwards says, this victory wasn't enough for me, I need a better victory in order to prove myself, and you wonder why anybody gives a shit about Samoa Joe. Yeah. I, I, what's sad is this was one of the best segments on the whole show. <laughs> it, may, it may have been. Russo is clearly, for the 147th time, trying to recreate Steve Austin. Be flawless this plan, it only worked for Steve Austin. He was unique that way. <laughs> you could show Steve Austin being a complete heel, and people would still love him. It doesn't work for everyone else. Then we had another skit with Borash, AJ, and Eric Young. It was not funny. Then we had a skit with Scott Steiner. James Storm was also there for literally no reason. And Petey Williams. That was ridiculous. Scott wanted Petey to give him his world title shot, and he would give him his cruiserweight title shot. He said Petey was too small for the heavyweights. Petey said, no way! Guaranteed 1,000% he'd be the next heavyweight champ. Scott said he would get it back whether Petey liked it or not, and I would guess that Petey will not like it. <laughs> Scott vowed to get his he said he would get his case back, which indicates this, this stupid feast or fired match was... It's been like a month now, and apparently we still technically don't know who went, who won. I guess if Scott beats up Petey and gets the briefcase back, that means he won again or something. What, what I really liked about this was how... Scott Steiner buried Petey Williams in the subtlest way possible. I don't even know if this is really that subtle. But Petey Williams is going on and on how big I am, how strong I am. And at one point, after he tells how strong I am, Scott Steiner just looks at his arm and flexes. And I realize he just buried him so far underground with that move right there. And Petey's Pete, going on how strong I am. And Scott just kind of does a tiny little flex. And says, yeah, okay. Yes, Petey is also shrinking rapidly, which helps the humor even more. Dustin came out with security, this being Dustin Rhodes, said he wanted to talk to Kaz. He does not know that he's Black Rain, apparently, even though when this character began, he did know he was Black Rain. Kaz came out and said he hated rats. They got in a fight. They did some shit. And then it was to the back. Okay, no. Oh, Kaz did a big dive, but then it was to the back. Yes, Kaz, in the sewer fight with Dustin Rhodes, did a bleacher dive. Wow, okay. Uh, it's also the point where Dustin said he's only there trying to get a job. For like three months now, <laughs> he's been trying to get a job backstage at TNA. He's done poorly. A, <laughs> who hired Black Rain? Sony hired Black Rain, though, and, and, and no one has told Dustin, hey, you're Black Rain. He doesn't watch his own fucking show? No well, wonder he doesn't have a job. He said he got hit by Kaz before, and I didn't know if he got like, hit from behind, and if he did get hit from behind, obviously he had to watch some sort of tape to know that it was done to him. He didn't seem to be aware of this Black Rain character, and then I saw like some commercial with Black Rain. I assume he's like the giant fat guy in a black suit, which looks, looks the most ridiculous costume I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> you have that about right. It's gold dust, but fatter and silver. Oh, it was <laughs> awful. Plus gay. My favorite part was that he's supposed to be some sort of like schizophrenic or Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde deal or whatnot. And as they're fighting, I remember hearing Mike Tomei scream, "Chris Saban, or I'm sorry, Kaz has lost his mind. He's like turned into a different person." I'm sitting there going. I think he's confused the gimmicks. I don't think he knows which guy is doing which, which deal he is. Yeah. Yes, oh that, that is not the deal. Uh, Black Rain beat up Kaz, and then Dustin was cutting a promo, and Kaz attacked him from the front. But Dustin said, no, no, I didn't get you as Black Rain or whatever the fuck. But the uh, the other great point here was when either Sine or West, one of them said, when Kaz looks at Dustin Rhodes, he sees Black Rain. Why are we still talking about this show? Because Everybody shut the fuck up. I'm wrapping this up. This is bullshit. We had a stupid thing with AJ and Kevin Nash when they did a, a history lesson about 1997. We had a year in review segment where they showed a bunch of comedy involving the fat, oily guy. That should tell you something right there. And then we had Robert Roode, Kurt Angle against Booker T and the mystery partner who was Christian. They had a match that went back and forth. And then uh, it was a good match. And then something happened. Uh, they doubled on Booker. Christian got the blind tag. Uh, AJ. The deal here, AJ came oh, out with a chair. I, I can tell you're falling apart here. You don't talk about this anymore. AJ Styles came out and he grabbed a chair. And he looked at the ring and there was Christian and there was Kurt and they were on opposing teams. And he didn't know who to help. So finally he threw down the chair and he left. And this eventually left to Robert Rude getting pinned after the axe kick at the end prettier. So Christian and Booker won. Hooray. I cannot believe we've talked about this show so much. Mike, do you have any final comments? I'm wrapping this review up. This is retarded. But this is the one that ended with like them both shoving microphones in front of AJ's face and AJ and crying off the air. Yeah, the, the, air. the, the like, show just, ended with, with, with Kurt and Christian yelling at AJ as he moped. Yeah, that was a hell of a... I love, I love that they Turn build up and the whole show is going to reveal who AJ chooses and then he just cries. Yeah, then they go out there without actually saying it. 
This show was lame, although I did, like I said, the main event was good. That was like, the main event was good, the Joe thing was pretty good, and Mike liked the girls. And other than that, a, a completely forgettable show. And why we talked about this for 25 minutes, I have no earthly idea, and I may kill myself. So, Mike, wow. yeah. Thanks for doing the show today there, buddy. Hey, no problem. I only have to watch DNA when I feel like it. That's right. Lucky you.